In the meantime, I was I was interrupting Danny. I was giving him a running count. That was fine. Was it all right? Yeah. I said, Danny, Ornette. He said, Oh yeah, Ornette. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, for, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I don't have anything to say. I was trying to think of the last song they played was like an ornament melody. That's what they kept. Oh, do, yeah. Do, 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 do. Yeah, what I, it was two I things. Was like, like, I should have looked at it when I got home. I, then I just went to bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sleep got you. Yeah. So, I guess we'll get started. Um, several things before we start reading. Um, the general strike, strike chapter. Excuse me for eating. <laughs> um, a couple things, just let you guys know. We had a get to know each other meeting with um, Mid Midwest Marks people. Two of them, Jonah and Carlos. Noah. Oh, pardon me, Noah and Carlos. I'm very sorry. And it. Um, Others can, you know, Michelle and others can say, it was a very good meeting. Mm. Very, and, you know, when you can talk with people and um, it's different than seeing them on podcasts. Mm -hmm. And um, they were really very nice guys. You want to say something? Who else was this? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. They were very nice. impressed with you. Why? Because you're talking about knowledge and um, knowledge categories. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it was nice. I haven't heard of them before. Mm -hmm. Their interactions with preschool and or like everybody talking about their podcast and stuff. So they were nice people. Mm -hmm. Um uh I felt like they were you know kind and open minded people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They had different backgrounds coming from and like I, it was just a, it was a personal discussion as well mm -hmm. as like us understanding um each other as organizations where we come from and you know why um i i think they started in college or like i don't know if it was noah saying mm -hmm, it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know disappointment with the bernie movement mm -hmm. they thought you know, as young, young people, oh, this is a socialist movement. I'm a socialist, Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. And just totally disappointed with that. And then seeing DSA is more of the same. Mm -hmm. And so they then say, well, we, the real socialism is among communists. Mm -hmm. And so they decide that they are communists. And so they join the Communist Party. And which for me is really more of the same. Mm -hmm. And they are disappointed with it, you know, but they think, you know, the Communist Party is this organization with this history, with mm -hmm. these resources, and these people know how to organize. At least that's what they perceive. But frankly, and I, I know they want to talk to me because they're interested in my experience, you know. Um, and um, yeah, it, uh, so I want to, you know, and, and Noah was so impressive. This is a young man who had been heroin addicted, has been clean for 16 years, lives in Cleveland, went to a school that was 80% black mm -hmm. and said of all the books that he read by Du Bois, he was most moved by the souls of black folk. Mm -hmm. And that was very impressive for me. Uh, and in a lot of ways, talking with them is like talking to us. Mm -hmm. And of course, we invited them to the Du Bois conference. They want to come. They they really dig Henry Winston. It's like us almost, you know. Uh, I think I think we're a little more developed in the sense that. We, I think we see a future in a different way mm -hmm. right now. But I mean, they're young and they're honest and they do things in good faith. Yeah. And that was, that was so, it was so impressive, so warm, very warm guys. Carlos is a, is a son of Cuban immigrants. Mm -hmm. 
and he's studying philosophy in a graduate program. Yeah, but go ahead, you want to say something? Oh, also, Jeremiah was there. Oh, you would have, oh, I'm sorry, I forget. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Jerry, you want to say something? No, yeah, I mean, uh, oh, go. Okay, I'll just say something briefly, but I think what struck me about them was their relationship to knowledge. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the rest of Midwestern Marxist is like, but what struck me about both of them was that, well, they could really honestly and, and in a very clear fashion explain what led them to certain ideas and then how their ideas had developed or changed. And it was very refreshing because their relationship to Marxism is not what I've generally seen in you know, academic environments, but then also in more cosmopolitan urban environments like Philadelphia and New York. And it, yeah, I, I felt like they were, well, there was just more of a sense of kinship between us than I think I originally expected just based off the idea that they were Marxists alone. And it was a really refreshing conversation because it didn't sound so different you know, what had led them to mid Midwestern Marxists from what led me to preschool, which mm -hmm. was this search for, you know, ideas that could um, more completely explain, like, our lives, the American situation, what was happening. And um, what was also interesting was that I think, um, well, Emily had talked about a lot of the ideas of preschool and they were largely in agreement or at least very receptive. And I think that they saw Marxism as a point of like unity or um, a framework toward a synthesis between us, which was also really interesting. For example, Emily had um, brought up the point about how there had been three American revolutions. And um, one of the guys had, had been in agreement with that and he said, if you have a Marxist framework for understanding American history, it would also lead you to the same understanding that there have been three American revolutions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know that much about Marxism, but generally they were just, I was really impressed by them as well, or just really refreshed by talking to them. Yeah, and even when they uh, talked about Henry Winston, because you're saying like yeah. Henry Winston was like either the base of the Communist Party or he was he was the Communist Party. Yeah. Like that's what it that was the essence of the Communist Party. And then we started talking about possibly uh, you know them interviewing Doc about his right you know history with Henry Winston and whatnot. Well, I think their relationship with ideas was really admirable because it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't abstract. It wasn't abstract, it wasn't theory for theory's sake, um, information for information's sake. They had a very, it was very clear that they had a very natural relationship to ideas that wasn't bookish or wasn't meant to cleave them away from their lives, which are very much defined by ordinary people, working people, poor people. Um, and I just found it very beautiful. I think it's also because I'm so used to like for a long time, I feel like I've had a very twisted relationship with knowledge because it always came from above. I was, you know, being fed certain things and theirs seem to be very much the opposite. Um, they also are a little bit older, uh, like in their in their 30s. And so it's not like they were first exposed to these ideas like in a university group. But I think they came to this a little bit later in their lives, maybe they're late in their mid 20s, kind of just reading and searching on their own. I think Noah's in his 30s, but Carlos is 24. Mm -hmm. What? Wow. Yeah, because he had just yeah, yeah, he just grad because he and he said that he and Eddie founded Midwestern Marks during undergraduate. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And they only founded it a few like two years ago or something like that. Oh. So they're pretty Carlos's pretty young. It's the beard that masks the age. <laughs> and then the fact that he has a wife. Mm -hmm. He has a wife and a baby, yeah. 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 And I I think and um, Noah might be older because he has his 13 yeah, year old son. Noah's older, yeah. Um, just to, yeah, just uh, I think I wasn't there for the whole conversation, but it was definitely refreshing since as as you were saying they approach things in good faith which i think is very rare these days um and i think 
it made me appreciate how important it is to have dialogue with people who I think, yeah, like there were so many things that we agreed on, but there were also interesting parts where like, I wanted to know more about like why they think a certain way mm -hmm. and like what led them to those conclusions. And it makes me really excited for the Du Bois Symposium, just because mm -hmm. I think like there is a need for like clarifying, like what is the path forward? And like, even the way that they frame like the crisis of the left as they understand it, I think they used like Carlos's big, I'd like his big like theoretical framework is something they call the purity fetish, um, which is like that the, the crisis of the left is because of what they call the purity fetish. And then they went down further and described it in terms of like the, what is it? The PMC, like professional managerial mm -hmm. class composition of the left, mm -hmm. the, what they also call the crisis of national nihilism where you mm -hmm. see a lot of like woke people who like basically hate America yeah. or like their whole political agenda is hating America. And then they also described it in terms of um, the left being against like existing like socialist states like China, mm -hmm. Cuba, and so on. But I think this question of knowledge and of like, like basically a revolutionary science that is fit for America is a very important question because their way of approaching it is like, we need to develop an American Marxism. Mm. And I feel like we see things yeah. slightly differently in the free school, but I think we need to be able to argue why we think that beyond just saying like, oh, like we don't think so. And to actually have a constructive dialogue on the basis of that. Cause it's like, ultimately I feel like we want similar things. It's mm -hmm. just that mm -hmm. our understanding of the path to getting there mm -hmm. is different in part because our theoretical like knowledge grounding is like, it is Du Bois, it is like Baldwin and King. And it's like, we proceed from that basis. And from that basis then, like, I think that allows us to like be open and to learn from people like Lenin and Marx and all those things. Mm -hmm. But I think like the Du Bois symposium will be a good opportunity to like flesh these things out um, yeah. in a way that's like actually engaging in fruitful dialogue mm -hmm. rather than just like, I don't know, smears or takedowns mm -hmm. and yeah. all that mm -hmm. stuff. So, yeah. so yeah. yeah. Yeah, what I also thought was interesting was Carlos in particular would emphasize a lot that the forces, like the force to keep an eye on to help explain phenomena or changes is historical, what was it, historical materialism? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, some form of dialectics, I forget. The dialectical phrase. materialism? Yes, dialectical oh, yeah. materialism. <laughs> and I think part of it's because he is a philosopher. Like he very much comes from a standpoint of philosophy. But what was interesting was even though that's what he was saying, what Noah and Carlos were very, the reason why they were also interested in free schools, not just because of, was yes, Doc, but also because they were interested in what they called community. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but the yeah. thing is, is that I don't think it was simply that they were interested in community. What they're interested in was how do you, like, basically in some ways in practice, how do you, grow like a cadre i guess how do you grow a cadre how do you grow like a community of people right. in a city and like what does that look like to take like to basically do political education yeah. like how do you how do you actually in some ways i would say it i would say it more as like how do you prepare the future generations to take power mm -hmm. to govern to be prepared to govern i thought i felt like that was what he was really saying okay. even though i don't think he would mm -hmm. necessarily say it like mm -hmm. that um but that's also why i liked i also thought i it really surprised me that noah said that noah made it like what you were saying noah made it a point to say like i listen to a lot of audiobooks when i'm working during the day because he does he's a carpenter so he like you know he can listen to audiobooks throughout the day and he said he was like everyone told me that i would like black reconstruction the best because black reconstruction, people frame it as um, Du Bois taking Marxism seriously and like is merging class struggle with race in black reconstruction, which is, I think is a different way than we even read black reconstruction. Yes. Um, but he said, he was like, I was surprised because I loved souls of black folk way more. He's like, I, I would put souls of black folk at the pinnacle of Du Bois more than black reconstruction. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it showed because it was also clear that both Carlos and Noah, and I'm assuming Midwestern Marks, they're interested in how do you explain the movement of the people? Like, I think that is, that's the key question. I mm -hmm. think they're starting to realize they need to answer. Um, and mm -hmm. for them, they've been approaching it from Marxism, like very much like mm -hmm. Marx, Marxism, mm -hmm. which is also like Jeremiah was saying, I'm really excited for the Du Bois Symposium, the Symposium on Black Reconstruction, because like the whole end of the program is to answer the question, how do you like, what kind of science do you need, like revolutionary science, what kind of revolutionary worldview do you need based on what foundation to explain the movement of the American people today? Mm -hmm. Like that is the practical question. That is the um, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. And, and like mm -hmm. Serafina was saying, I just like, they were just really warm people mm -hmm. and they were just so earnest. Like they really wanted to just like talk. Mm -hmm. And just like, you know, like talk about everything, anything. Um, yeah, and it's really nice. And I hope they can come to Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, it seems like they want to. They want to send people from the Midwest to um, Philly since we're mm -hmm. not that far from the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And what state are they in? Multiple oh, states. Right. Oh, they're all the Midwest. The Midwest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I know if it was like one Midwest <laughs> the Midwest. I don't know who's don't... familiar with Cleveland besides Kathy. Okay. But, <laughs> but yeah, Noah's from East. He made a point to say, I'm from East yes. Cleveland. Mm -hmm. I'm from East Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And he's like, and you know, it, and Michelle asked the interesting question of like, why why did you name yourself Midwestern yeah, Marks? Because Michelle was approaching yeah. it from more of a like, is there something special about the Midwest mm. and historically certain forces that have shaped the people, all this stuff. And they were like, oh no, it's accidental. But see, they, but I think there is like, what, yeah, what there much, is yeah, there's something yeah. deeper in that. Yeah, they definitely don't, oh, they don't feel bicoastal for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, mm -hmm. they move like, and uh, like they move slow, like they're in the top. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a topical on for hours, and then you start to go. But I like it so because that was a part of the conversation. That we, and also, apropos the point, it's a kind of a part of the process of getting to know each other. We we bring out what's best in each other, and we have to develop yeah. that too. But um, when we were talking about Philly. And Emily was like, well, <laughs> I'm not, I'm just not going to say that, but she was, <laughs> it was like, well, Philly's good, you know, Midwest is good, but Philly's pretty good too. <laughs> um, so we were kind of like going back and forth about that. And, and you know, that, that was a part of that, like, that personable thing or that, um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, it's just like the nature of where they're from. And so they're describing like, or... I think it was Noah. I don't know that because <laughs> I was at work, so I was only listening kind of as much as I could and saying as much as I could. But but um, he was talking about like his neighbors and stuff, and it just gave me a certain feeling about where he was from. Mm -hmm, so I was mm -hmm. like, you know, that's in, it's in, you know, yeah. Pretty good. Wait, what did they explain historical materialism as? Uh, we'll, we'll come back. <laughs> I, 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 we'll get to that in a minute. Um, I'll just bring it. History, history is the history of class conflict, the history of people's movements, not the history of ideas. Gotcha. So materialism is in social science, people, institutions, movements, classes. That's, you know. Thank um, you. And I also wanted to mention or emphasize that they weren't for theory for theory's sake, but they also weren't like people who do action just for the sake of action. Mm -hmm. um, and I had just, I the only two things I did mention was how, like that thing about theory because, and, and another thing we had to describe was why the civil rights movement, like why King and why Du Bois in yeah. particular, because um, there is that, but yeah. Yeah. The other, the other interesting thing too was that so Midwest and Marx they call it it's like an institute, mm -hmm. but almost all of the people who write for them they said there was around like fifty people who write for them. The vast majority of them are within like existing leftist parties, like the mm -hmm. CPUSA, PSL, um, ESA. Then they say they were in CP, the they're, they're in, party, and then they, they got blacklisted or something. But they're still, they're still in the party. Mm -hmm. okay. 
Yeah. And I think that that in itself also poses an interesting question about like, because th- it's almost like, I think they're also trying to work through the question of like, is the primary task now like a political party mm-hmm. based on your understanding of like the larger questions? Um, but mm-hmm. yeah. This might not be very relevant. We can just touch on it very briefly, but do you, would, would people mind shedding light on how they're organized or what they're, <laughs> how, they, how they're connected to all these 50 writers, but also yeah. how they decide or maybe on that, so maybe should have been yeah. <laughs> how they make decisions. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. My guess is it seems like they have leadership actually. It seems like there's the core. Right, right, it okay. seems like they have yeah. other like editors. Yeah, they have editors, mm-hmm. and then it's the main people who have the podcast, I think. Mm-hmm. And then, and then people write for them, but they're not necessarily part of the institute. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know in terms of formal structure, like oh, do you pay do you pay dues? Are you just like a collective of people? Mm-hmm. And they came in for. Uh, some hostile criticism mm-hmm. because of the the podcast that they had with the young man that had written the critical review of Gerald Horn's mm-hmm. Counter Revolution. Mm-hmm. I don't know if anybody saw that on okay. Facebook. Yeah. And um, and I know the person that uh, you know kind of started that um, thread. And I I know because he was a graduate student when I was teaching at Temple. And he, um, and I know he was talking about me. He said, what, what the, this was all about the white left attacking Gerald Horn. This is, you know, we'll talk, you know, that's what, what Henry Winston calls the skin strategy. It's not the substance, it's the, uh, the color. So, yeah, that's a whole thing, but we can get into that later. But mm-hmm. then they said one of the strategies of the white left is to use one black scholar against another. Mm-hmm. So they meant me against Gerald mm-hmm. Horn. You know, like they say, well, just say my name. You know? And then we can go back and forth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like Gerald Horn so long. And that's a story in itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway. Mm-hmm. Okay, unless there's anything else to say about that. Uh, we had a wonderful concert last night. I know you're going this. Oh, this yeah. yeah. Uh, and the reason I, when, I, when I saw the bass play, I said, where's Caleb? <laughs> you know, Charlie Mingus. But um, I don't know. Can you say something about it? Uh, anybody? Michelle? It was, well, it's, it's that moment in the development of jazz, which was as a, you know, something called a paradigm shift. And it is what is identified, sometimes they call it avant-garde jazz, free jazz, collective improvisation. But the key figures are like Sun Ra, John Coltrane, uh, Ornette Coleman, Eric Dolphy, Don Cherry, uh, or just, uh, and um, who else? I, you know, the, the art ensemble of Chicago um, and so on. And I, I often say it is the jazz that I'm most familiar with that I, and that I'm most attached to. In other words, I understand what many people would call noise and unfocused, mm. you know, jazz. It is more, I find it more understandable Mm. than, let us say, um, uh, Hawk or uh, Coleman Hawkins Mm. or Lester Young or even uh, Dizzy Gillespie. Mm. Mm. You know, um, I really, it just, that's what I listened to. That's why I was the whole time I'm always, I was bothering (laughs) Danny with my commentary. (laughs) Danny, that's one at Coleman they play in now. Oh yeah, that's uh, Sun Ra. Oh yeah, that's uh, Eric Dolphy. <laughs> he said, Eric Dolphy? <laughs> but um, it is 
It is the revolutionary music. It is the music that I de- musicians that identified themselves with the global revolutionary struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, frankly, it's the most optimistic music celebratory of the people and their capacity to struggle. And and then of course as a genre, they're all it's um it's free jazz, collective improvisation. That's why you don't just have the drummer and the bass player and the piano player, the quote rhythm section in the background keeping the beat going while the front line, which is usually the trumpet and the tenor, or sometimes two, two saxophonists um, playing. It is, that's why you hear, tonight I gotta go, cause they're gonna have two drummers. <laughs> and I haven't seen two drummers. Well, I saw one drummer playing two drum sets at one gig. <laughs> you know, now that was something, one drummer playing two drum sets. That's a whole nother story. I've been trying to find out where that guy is. I want to see it again. (laughs) But two drummers, which means that it's not like the drummer and the piano player or the drummer and the uh, tenor or saxophone player. Now you have an interaction between drummers. So it's very fascinating. It's a, I consider it to be the most complex of all forms of music and the most futuristic, and I would even say the most intercivilizational. Mm-hmm. I just, uh, and as you all know, it's like, like um, um, what's the young man, Leslie? Isaiah, the uh, tenor, I, only 23 years old. This, you know, he's a tall, skinny guy, man. Mm. And uh, actually, he his tone reminded me so much of Coltrane. And then his fingering, mm. all of the notes, it was just, it's like I died and going to heaven. It was like being at free school. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. It was, but... <laughs> I, and I, that's why I kept talking, always, when last time when I was with Alice talking all the time to Alice, that's this, that's the <laughs> other. Because if, it's just like Du Bois or Baldwin, if you understand that, a whole world, a universe opens up. It is that profound. And and Bobby Zankel yeah. is providing a, an enormous contribution to Philly, to the to the United States, and to the world, in keeping this alive, mm-hmm. this because this is I consider it the cutting edge. Mm-hmm. That jazz that I think has most influenced European classical music, you know, in the sense of the um, what they call uh, improvisational music. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, I know, uh, for example, that uh, performers and composers like Cecil Taylor are like gods in Germany. Mm-hmm. And for you to be a god in Germany where they got Bach and Mozart, you know, all of that going on, you have to be a god, literally. Mm-hmm. And of course, Coltrane, they, they played a thing from Coltrane's album, Interstellar Space. I was just like, oh shit, God, what am I going to do now? I'm to train, man. Because, you know, people don't play train like that. And then, of course, Sumi from West Philly is Bobby always. She, she's a, she's, first of all, she's a virtuoso. She knows the music. She's a composer. And, um, yeah, what she was doing was just, but I, that was a, a great evening that we spent together. And I guess we're going back tonight. Some of <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, anything, anything I'll, like? well, I'll say that I relate to what you said. Well, it, it was helpful to hear what you said about how you actually think free jazz is more 
understandable to you than right. let's say bebop or yes what's what's the art blakey style a hard pop yeah well because well, because I listened to a little bit of free jazz in the past, but then I stopped listening to it a long time because I basically thought that bebop made more sense, or bebop was more digestible. So, like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, let's mm -hmm. say a lot of the jazz ballads, or like, yeah, Lester Young, Oscar Peterson is bebop, right? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. no, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You call him bop, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I found free jazz hard to listen to, but mm -hmm. actually hearing you talk about it made it like it clicked more into place and then after that performance i listened to ornette coleman for the first time in a long time on the way home and i could actually i felt like i could actually hear much more of it and i think i actually agree with what you're saying that free jazz is the future because danny and i talked a little bit when we were walking afterwards yes. and we both agreed that free jazz is music that really makes you stand at attention and it it, I think it's music that forces you to enter into some sort of a dialectical relationship with the music you're hearing, unless unless you just like tune it out completely. And um, I think it is different from even bebop, which I feel like is music that raises the consciousness, but it is still easier to kind of just let it be or let it sit. Um, free jazz is something different. Well, because after the concert, Danny was saying like, I'm tired. You know, I'm really tired because I was really listening. Um, but I feel like the voices are really strong with the way that Bobby plays and that yep, that other young saxophonist, and there really is a message there. Um, so yeah, I just, I liked what you said, and it made me realize new things about the music. Yeah. What's that? Thank you. Um, I don't, I don't want to talk too much, but... Uh, you haven't even talked okay. at all. <laughs> uh, let's see, what was I thinking of? Uh, I the, I guess when I was thinking, it's like, so when you're listening to free jazz, it's not going to have like a modal center. It's not going to be in a key, maybe not even being a time signature. Mm -hmm. And, I, well, okay, I'm only just left, but I was thinking about, you know, she mentioned the, the bass part at one time. And I was just thinking like, like the saxophonist or the bass player, they were like trying to, this is my interpretation, push the limits of what's even intelligible, mm -hmm. right? You know, like the bass player would start like, he would touch the string, like in the double bass, he would mm -hmm. touch the strings over the bridge mm -hmm. and he would set, he would hit parts of the mm -hmm. double bass and the, the drummer, and maybe it was probably hard to hear from where we were sitting, but like the cymbal, there's a little pitch that's different depending on where even on a ride symbol you hit it and then he would kind of you know like hit parts of that and the saxophonist and i don't play saxophone i know there's that thing called false harmonics and things like that it was like he would push he would push it out of tune and then kind of play with that out of tune thing or something mm -hmm. like that and then the other thing to keep in mind was like you know they would all be playing and then someone would play something and then they would all kind of imitate it and yes. then it would be like this motif mm -hmm. and then they would start talking about it that's the best way i can say it like they'd be like oh. da, da, da. and then sumi would kind of very like she would drag it right so if it's like da, 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 then she would go da, da, oh yeah, da, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. kind of like that and then the bass player would be like it would make it uh like um straight right so if you swing it like da, 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 when you go da, 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 like that so there would be like this way that they would all play on something and then i don't know it was like uh that's why i said it was exhausting because mm -hmm. you know i didn't mean that in a bad way i just meant like i can't the second set i paid the last song i was like zoning out but that's yeah, just because yeah, i was yeah, up yeah, from yeah. whatever that morning and you know it's just like a lot a lot of it and then I don't know. They would like get a little idea and then they would just like play it a lot, like the saxophonist, like, uh, 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 and then you start doing that again and again and again. And then he would start bending the reeds so that it's sharp and stuff like that. I don't know. It was, that's, and I don't even know if like maybe if I asked them about it, they'd be like, you know, I used to ask musicians about this after I would hear them play and I'd go, what were you thinking when you played this? <laughs> and they would go, I don't know, I was thinking like, I got to get milk at the grocery store. <laughs> and I guess it goes back to what I, Isaiah said and what Emily read at the beginning, which is like, it's not always like people are thinking 
this is what I'm doing, right. right? There's a little bit of, there's like a weird space of when you're just waking up. So I know, some violinist said something like the best he ever played was he took a nap and he overslept and someone said, you have to be on stage right now. And I went, okay. <laughs> that's like the best, that's the part that you're trying to get into in music where it's like right in between being like mm -hmm. conscious and kind of, it's probably why people did drugs. I'm not saying don't do drugs. <laughs> you don't have to do drugs. They're very clean people. There's some that you can access that. But in other words, what the drugs are imitating is that state of that mm -hmm. they're kind of letting a part of their brain open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That happens when you dream as well, where it's a little like something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And so, yeah. See, this is so, just telling yeah. me like, it's just why you need both you don't you can't just have like the artist without like the intellectual yes. or the intellectual yes. without the artist yes and like i just know people who are like well are just like in the middle of things and don't and don't do things for the popularity but still are like um trying to make art and stuff um but it's like now there's so few um real revolutionary and real dedicated like intellectuals that could be a part of a who could see um the whole picture um so it was it's it's yeah it's nice hearing what you guys have to say mm -hmm. i'll interrupt quickly that's why for hegel part of the art is not just the art but the critic because mm. the art lives on, it goes beyond the person. You get into some dangerous territory okay. now. Okay. Nope. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, go ahead, Dan. No, I was going to say you that. You see, me, say and, me and Jeremiah reacted the same because we read the same article. Well, go ahead. Oh, what was it? It was an article or something? Uh, well, I'll let Jeremiah. I just say my point. <laughs> yeah, go, please, please. That, I'm sorry. You know, because like, you kept turning me into. You, it says, what I'm trying to say is that art is a social activity, yeah. and so it goes beyond just the people on stage. Right, right, right. Right, okay. and so that it lives on. In other words, it's not. That's why it's the answer to the art is not simply asking the artist, "What did you mean?" Because there's a way in which something goes beyond them. Yeah. That's all I wanted to say. I don't know no, if no, I said no, something. No, 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 no. But uh, uh, Jeremiah had posted a. Review of the movie Par. Tar. Par. <laughs> Up to Par. But, you know, there's a postmodern movement that's been, been going on for 60 years in literature and art. Just so you know. And I don't know whether you saw the movie Tar. I, I haven't. Yeah. Yes, I have to now. But, um, uh, it's a very controversial movie at the intellectual level, how to interpret it. You know, you could take a postmodern view of it, which means you don't like the movie, or you could take uh, an anti-postmodern view of it, which means you would tend to like the movie more. You probably heard of Roland Barthes and Michel Foucault. Yeah, that, I meant Hegel. I was not yeah, in that yeah, realm. Yeah. <laughs> Just so but I'm certain they would, well, anyway, but see this idea that once the art is produced, the artist has no ownership or nothing to say about it. It's all a matter of interpretation. So you, you get it, you hear it all the time. I will interpret this from an Afrocentric point of view, or I will interpret this from a feminist point of view. What the, so it doesn't, it, the work is disembodied, mm -hmm. and now it is uh, given meaning based on what is the current fad, so to speak. That, that's all we was, and uh, it's just like saying, well, Du Bois wrote Black Reconstruction, but 75, 80 years later, uh, it's not Du Bois, it's, it's mine. And uh, I can, inter like, like a horn would say, I can interpret it uh, from a quote black, uh, uh, what I say, settler colonialist point. You know, you know what I'm saying. That that's all we. That's why we responded. Not that we were uh, necessarily contesting Hegel. But no. I would say that, like, without Hegel, 
you probably wouldn't have like the art movements and scientific movement that mm -hmm. you know came after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Um. There's there's a decent number of face or YouTube and Facebook comments. Oh, okay. Um. Todd says, I agree that Souls of Black Folk truly expresses Du Bois' humanness. And then someone named E. Pluribus Regnum. Oh, I like the cult. Like someone's YouTube account name um, is E. Pluribus Regnum. I don't know what their real name is, but they say that re responding to the, the stuff about Midwestern Marx, they said, there is a core leadership at, at Midwestern Marx with editors that review submitted articles. The people who submit articles are usually Marxists that the editors know through various associations. I came to write for Midwestern Marx by getting to know Noah, who then encouraged me to write an article on a topic that they felt added. Oh, okay. Uh, this person's name is Wade Patton, by the way. Um, who then encouraged me to write an article on the topic they felt added to understanding the current material economic conditions. And I imagine that that's how they evaluate, evaluate most of their authors for contribution. So the first step is, uh, Midwestern Marx editors make sure that the article that the article for submission is sound, and then second, they get to know the author before publishing. Um, so this is just ex clarifying like the structure of Midwestern Marx. And then someone named BK also adds Cecil Taylor's name as one of the avant the free jazz avant garde yeah, traditions. Um, Philip Logan asks any thoughts on Thelonious Sphere Monk. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, he's great that's my yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and is a i would say oh god danny told me a i story. can't we can't repeat the story though <laughs> it's such a like bad it's a bad okay okay we won't repeat this yeah. about monk playing like uh uh, but like how? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're, you're telling the you story just already. Did. Yeah. <laughs> it's Sonny Rollins apparently heard Monk playing like Bud Powell was another. Uh, he was walking song. past a club. They, well, they were I, they were going to like because they were um, rehearsing for I think for Link. Oh, Mars, okay, okay. And he was like, "Oh, yeah, that sounds like Bud Powell." And he's and Monk is like, "Yeah, and if you tell me, I'll kill you." Like, <laughs> yeah, that, I'm but playing this like this is like an apocryphal <laughs> Sonny yeah, Rollins. Yeah, yeah, song. yeah. Don't, but yeah. But Monk, yeah, Monk is a, a, in a lot of ways, a predecessor of people yeah. uh, of the avant-garde. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll also say, okay, the one thing I'll say about the Tar movie review, because, okay, okay, well, like, it was, it was very gratifying and satisfying to read that article, because, I, you know, I did, I did, like, English as a major in college, mm -hmm. and when you take the literary theory courses, they're still pushing people like Foucault, mm -hmm. Milan Barth, Sals like I think they're saying Sancerre. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Strauss. I think I didn't read. No. You probably read Strauss, but um, <laughs> it's such a <laughs> like that style, that movement of literary crit like critique mm -hmm. and literary theory. It just it takes all the joy out of art mm -hmm. like that's just like the at a baseline the feeling that you get like it takes all the joy out of art mm -hmm. and the art that's produced out of that that intellectual movement it also has no joy basically mm -hmm. and i think it's not like the point is not to like reassert like the the god authority of the author or something mm -hmm. but rather to assert that like first of all that there is artistic genius and that mm -hmm. that should be taken seriously and recognized and appreciated mm -hmm. but also like the what like the thing i appreciated about tar is that it asserts both the responsibility of the artist as well as the audience mm -hmm. and like the audience shouldn't like that as like people who receive art it's not like you can just have free reign to interpret it how you will to impose like all these things on it as you will and that yeah in a way it's like like what I feel most intuitively with jazz, which is that it is a social, like every jazz performance is not just about the artist, but about the artist and the audience, mm -hmm. and that you need both sides of that relationship in order for art to, for jazz to succeed. Like I it felt in some ways that the movie Tar was kind of asserting the necessity of that, because I think the first time that I ever actually appreciated jazz ever was like through the free school mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. going and going to free school events where there would be jazz performed mm -hmm. because before then i like jazz didn't make any sense to me at all because um, i didn't grow up listening to jazz mm -hmm. and 
And I think, yeah, going to free school like events was the first time that I realized like one, it's just like, I don't know, physically sitting there and then like the audience like reacting, but then also seeing like how musicians relate to each other and are like talking to each other um, through music. I think that was the first time I was like, oh yeah, actually I'm starting to like kind of feel what jazz is about. Cause mm -hmm. I think it, even stuff like A Love Supreme, like I tried to listen to it before but I feel like it's, I don't know, it's kind of hard when you're not really raised in that like yeah, kind of tradition. Question. And so I think, yeah, free school helped a lot in terms yeah. of even being able to appreciate yeah. like that kind of music. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but Dan, you, wanted to, you, were, you were gonna say something. Uh, uh, well, I maybe we can transition into black reconstruction through art in a way, because if there's a question of interpreting history, because mm. okay. I, I guess, uh, well, well, let me try to complicate the thing. I haven't read the, the Tar review or watched the movie, so I'm not yeah, yeah. prepared to When it comment. comes back out, I'll take you. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not prepared to comment on this, but I guess in a sense, all history and all art is an inter is one that has to interpret it, right? In other words, to make it, to understand it all, there's an active interpretation. Mm -hmm. And to me, the problem with the postmoderns is actually they fix, they like, you were right, oh, I'm gonna do a deconstruction. They're right. actually fixing what they're already gonna do. Right, it's yeah. the same formula. Basically, everyone's applying the same formula. Everybody's, and in that sense, they're not really even doing a critique, they're no. doing a dismissal. Yeah, because, because, yeah, the critic takes, like, supersedes the actual art itself. That's right, that's the mm -hmm. critic. You know, actually, when I first met Jeremiah at Cornell, I never saw a more depressed person. Oh, no. And I said, how you doing, man? He said, I'm taking a course in Asian literature, oh, and we're halfway oh, through the course, and we've not read one Asian writer. <laughs> you weren't that bad. I was also in that course, dog. It was just you so you didn't even remember me. That's fine. You didn't remember me. <laughs> but I remember walking across this dark uh -huh. campus with uh -huh. Jeremiah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, who put you, who assigned him to that? I did know. Oh, yes. oh, I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you, can't, you can't go and just jump on that without him jumping in. That was some preparation to be a revolutionary. All revolutionaries <laughs> have a depressed moment. Lenin did this. Yeah. I know that's why you said that. I know that's why you said But okay. Following the truth. Before we jump into. Um, let me just oh, do a couple really things. Uh, we, uh, Serafina wants to. We'll talk a little bit about the planning for the events coming up. But um, yesterday uh, was the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Amilcar Cabral, and as you remember, in the 10th anniversary, Amilcar was one of the figures in the African independence movement that we highlighted. I would just, um, I, I posted on my uh, Facebook page an interview that I did yesterday with uh, Don DeBar, mm -hmm. but it, my interview was followed by a speech that Angela Davis had given mm -hmm. back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. A great speech, by the way, mm -hmm. um, parenthetically, because I know, I know you are always asking, well, how could she talk like that then and talk like she does today? That's a big question. And, you know, there is no question of the Angela Davis of then was filled with revolutionary optimism. Uh, she was what everybody would, would think a great revolutionary would be, how they would talk, their intellect. Is, and, I, and I say this, uh, because I was close to up close to her, and I mean just heroic, courageous woman. And how do you get to this? And yeah, I was thinking about this, you know, because I'm I try I always say I'm kind of the same as I was then, but I did not have put upon me the pressures that were upon her. What do I mean by that? With the collapse of the Soviet Union, in a lot of ways, the world changed. 
you know, and, and all of her, the assumptions that she was proceeding upon were no longer the same, but she's a public figure. So how do you now talk to a public that is in a different world? You know, uh, well, you know, one solution would be, well, you don't talk as much mm -hmm. until you can assess the situation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say, of course, and this I would say this to Midwest Marx and these people, uh, I think she made a huge error in going from what she was to what she is now. The Angela Davis of then, you could not imagine her supporting a Hillary Clinton under any circumstances. You know what I'm saying? Um, but the pressures of being Angela Davis or being Muhammad Ali are very different than you know being someone like myself who is just a normal person and has space and time to think. Yes. You know, when you're Angela Davis, everybody wants you to speak, mm -hmm. you know, and the political foundations of your world are no longer the same. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm always saying, I don't know if you can really grasp. Mm -hmm. It's like somebody pulled the, the floor out from under you and you fall into a, you know, that kind of, I guess you, you know, you see it in movies, some like in comedic, old comedic movies, the floor comes out, you fall right down into some. That's what it was like. And, you know, even for myself, I get the sense of all these years having, of climbing out of that hole. How do we get out of this hole? And uh, I honestly do feel that way a lot of times. But now I feel that we're out of that hole. I honestly do. Uh, it was, it was, it's, a, it, and I can imagine, because I know, you know, we all, and so we all fell. And then some people said the way we come out of that hole is by renouncing everything and becoming social democrats. They actually said that. Angela actually became that, you know. The Communist Party is that, uh, and like they say, unapologetically black, but unapologetically social Dems, being led by the liberals. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, but anyway, I just wanted to say that. But anyway, when you listen to Angela's speech on Emil Carr and his assassination, it is that is mm -hmm. Angela Davis, the great revolutionary. Mm -hmm. I mean, and to speak the way she spoke mm -hmm. took enormous courage, mm -hmm. enormous courage. Although we had kind of gotten beyond the bloodlust of the assassinations of the 60s. You know what I'm saying? So they weren't like shooting people down in public mm -hmm. the way they did King and Kennedy and all that type of thing, but still enormous courage. But then, of course, there was the Communist Party. And I, I would say, in particular, Henry Winston. And I mean that really seriously. Um, you know, he not only, you know, theorized and strategized the movement for her freedom, but it was like uh, an older guy wrapping his arms, I'm going to protect you. Don't worry. Yeah. And um, yeah. that was that was very important. You know, I know I felt confident mm. that she was in good hands, even though we're all fighting for her freedom and such. But I, I, just, I just wanted to make that point. So this speech is a very important <laughs> uh, speech. It kind of clarifies that moment in the African movement. Emil Carr had just been assassinated only months after the party that he led had established in the liberated zones, people's assemblies, etc. And so they were going and they had gone to the UN and the UN General Assembly had voted almost unanimously 
to recognize these, this government in the liberated areas where Portuguese colonialism could not come into as the legitimate government of uh, uh, Guinea and Cape Verde. Quite historic move. Okay, then Don interviews me and I try to say that indeed that is the, you know, true and you know what we've talked about and Angela was absolutely right. But now, as I say, what goes around comes around. And we're back to the same contradiction, but only now in the struggle against neocolonialism. This uh, contradiction of freedom versus imperialism, to put it in simplistic, not simple, but ordinary terms. And what I talk about is Amilcar, uh, Modiba Keita, uh, Marion and uh, Patrice Lumumba, and the grotesqueness of these assassinations. But I also bring up, and this is what is seldom mentioned, Amilcar was a communist leading a national democratic movement. So it is a communist not trying to build a communist party in Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde, but building a national liberation movement, which has a radical revolutionary leadership which foresees socialism as what must be achieved if Guinea and Cape Verde are to be truly free. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So a kind of a convergence, a fusion of both the political independence and the movement towards national economic independence. Sometimes we called it the non-capitalist path. Sometimes we called it a leap through the centuries, from backwardness to modernity. Not in one year or two, you, but you get the point that I'm making. That's what Amilcar imagined and foresaw, and that's what guided and anchored his leadership. That's what Marion and Guabe saw and that's Patrice Lumumba, and they were all killed. This cadre, and, and you know, I'll say again, you know, coming up, it was, you know, um, it was like normal. Okay, you had neo-colonialist leaders like uh, Senghor in Senegal or uh, whoever the leaders were in Liberia uh, or the ones that overthrew Nkrumah in Ghana, yeah, or Kenya. We knew they were uh, more or less on the side of the West in this great battle of imperialism versus anti-imperialism. But then we knew that there was an Emil Card, there was an Augustino Neto in Angola, there was uh, the great movement in Mozambique, uh, and of course, as I you know, I always tell y'all, my favorite, the great Marion and Guabe. And we saw those films of him. And I actually, I, you know, when I saw when uh, Nuri and them put the film together, I, I don't remember ever physically seeing it on film any other way, Marion and Guabe. I never mm -hmm. remember seeing him. And this was this very short, very youthful, young looking guy who was proclaiming the same thing that you would hear from Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam or Kim Il Sung in Korea and so on, or what we would, people like myself would be talking about. And that's why, I'm talking too much, but that's why Henry Winston talks about neo-pan-Africanism. What he is saying is that, one, he said, this is not the pan-Africanism of Du Bois. That's the first thing he said. Mm -hmm. But what he is also saying, this is a pan-Africanism that talks about African unity, but only on terms of anti-communism. Mm -hmm. And 
I'm telling you, you know, again, having lived through a lot of this, it was toxic and lethal. You know, for myself, a lot of times shit would be coming at me. I couldn't figure out what, what did I say wrong? What did I do? But it was because I, and, and still to this day, sometimes I feel free school would do better without me. If you all did the same thing without me, no, because see, all I'm saying, Kat, is I draw attention. So if I'm in it, I have to be uh, mm. leading people by the nose into the abyss of communism. Believe me, a lot of times I can't figure. I said, we're just, we're just reading Du Bois. But it's not that we're just reading Du Bois. It's that mm. this guy who has this history and we know about it has these people, young people reading Du Bois. So it has to be stopped mm -hmm. or it has to be isolated or it has to be uh, smeared or it has to be trivialized, you know? Uh, but anyway, what Winston, and this, I, I really, <laughs> And it's still not understood. It was, I don't feel it was ever fully grasped or understood within the Communist Party. The significance of what he was saying. Because he knew, which was then, but is really the case now, that Africa will play a strategic and central role in the undoing of Western imperialism. If you just look at the equation or the, as we say, the correlation of forces, take China. China is huge, second largest economy in the world, technologically advanced. But in a standoff with the West, which means Japan and South Korea, that's the West too, you know, there might be some deficits on China's side. China, in other words, China would need Africa. You dig? As Russia needs Africa. And Africa, so it's like, you know, has it, what goes around comes around. We're back to the correlation of forces of the moment when Amilcar and those were assassinated in order to undermine the anti neo colonial struggle, we're back to that, but where Africa and Asia are more capable now of resisting the West. I, I cannot, I don't, you know, I, I, I always say I'm linguistically and, and vocabularily, I don't even know if that's a word challenged so i don't always have the words to say what i'm trying to say but it is an inflection point as they say and africa this time however without the likes of emil Carr and marion and guabe we don't have that leadership however there is a certain experience mm -hmm. and capacity of the leadership that does exist, mm -hmm. which is more generalized across Africa than it was back then, which means then that Africa can decide the future, for example, by the way they vote in the UN General Assembly, mm -hmm. by the way they vote in the UN Security Council on issues that are existential for the West, such as Ukraine. Mm -hmm. you, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we're back to the same struggle of that moment on, but on a higher level. And frankly, I think where the stakes are higher and where the West 
is much weaker than they were then. If, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I tried. So Emil Carr and Marion Nguabi and Patrice Lumumba and Modiba Keita and Sekatura, the memory that there were communists and socialists leading these movements. And this is what the Afrocentrists who Winston called, and that's, you know, they, they weren't called Afrocentrists then, neo-Pan-Africanists, fake Pan-Africanists, anti-communist Pan-Africanists. A lot of people trivialize anti-communism. For example, when I was fired at Temple, and I was fired, they tried to say, oh, no, we just didn't renew your contract. No, you fired me. You fired me. Malefe Asante, I may have told the story before, came out on Facebook and said, Tony is not a scholar. He's nothing but a communist apparatchik. For a lot of people, it becomes, oh, well, what's so bad about that? Malefe just, just doesn't like communism because he's so pro-black. Yeah. And that black shit is a, is a sinkhole hole too, you know? Uh, and Winston, well, okay, I'll come to that again. Malefe is so pro-black that he's against all white ideologies. Okay. You dig what I'm saying? Okay. You did, you, mm -hmm. So some, a lot of people said that. And so they dismissed yeah. mm -hmm. him firing me mm -hmm. on that basis. I understood it because of my history. I didn't have time to explain it to all the graduate students who are opportunists and careerists anyway. But of course he went to the board of trustees and administration because it was you know, kind of a big movement. It was in the press and shit. You know, Ontario challenging this bullshit. <laughs> and what was I, 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 that's what I do, please. If you thought that you were gonna do this, and I was just gonna walk away and you know and and cry and shit. No, dog. You want you want to do it like that? Let's get it on. Mm. And so he had to run and hide behind. He's so black, black. Why are you hiding behind white people? Yeah. The administration. Come on out, dog. Me and you. I'm black. You black. Let's get it on. And I didn't mean you know that we would have to throw hands. <laughs> 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 I could laugh now, but if you can't go take your your money, your, you can't pay your mortgage and took your health care, mm. you can't help your children out, you know, all that don't mean nothing. He's a since he's a communist, mm. he deserves it. Mm. Believe me. So um, but it's so interesting, parenthetically, let me just say. You know, in the course of the struggle, we took the dean down. She was forced to resign and get out of there. We took the provost down, and eventually the president went down. <laughs> but I still couldn't get my gig back. <laughs> but anyway, we did enough damage <laughs> I mean, <laughs> to say, well, it was a, a partial victory, <laughs> really. And then, you know, because, you know, and, and the guy, the founder, by, by the way, the founder of Temple, Russell Conwell, mm -hmm. the two heroes of his life were John Brown and Frederick Douglass. Yeah. So I, I kind of brought that to the fore. Mm -hmm. But then I said that this is not only about me. Mm -hmm. This is about Temple's mm -hmm. plan to gentrify yeah. North Philly, mm -hmm. which then morphed into the Stadium Stompers movement which again, another victory. I don't want to start cursing, but we stopped them from building a 35,000 seat football stadium at Broad and Norris, which would have demeaned this neighborhood, yeah. taken it further down, and of course, jeopardize this church. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Once you do that, a weakened community, and this community is weakened. 
but we were able to fight. We stopped that. So we had, and, and that was a part of the struggle that people did not see it as a communist being let go because all he's teaching is communism and misleading young people, you see. Um, but this was anticipated in Winston's writing. And no, and it, 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 that, that's why you're right. A kind of dogmatic Marxism, you can't see the struggle because you're always looking back. Now, what Winston said, Du Bois' Pan-Africanism was not anti-communist. Du Bois' Pan, see, if you're anti-communist, and that's why, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little, uh, why is the name Marion and Guabe mm -hmm. not talked about by the Pan-Africanists who were so black, mm -hmm. you know, that they have a litmus test. Mm -hmm. Tony, you ain't black enough. Why ain't I black enough? You ain't black enough because you read white books. Really? <laughs> you ain't black. You ain't black. Because Du Bois, and then Du Bois ain't black enough. Yeah. I mean, you, you know how. Well, who is black? Well, Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, Marcus Garvey was a clown and a fraud. Yeah, but he was black. <laughs> du, Bois, du Bois had a, he talked like a, a New Englander. Yeah, he did. And he wasn't trying to, you know, be authentic by talking like he was from down south. Yeah. He wasn't from down <laughs> south. But I just said, but nobody's black enough. And that's what went, but see, that black, black shit, goes hand in glove with the anti-communism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they were saying, which was a neo-colonialist strategy, separate the African liberation and independence movements from the Soviet Union, other socialist countries, including Cuba and Vietnam and uh, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, separate Africa, which then, what is the option? Okay, we want Africa to do its own thing and go it alone. But go it alone means ultimately pushing them back towards their colonial masters. Well, I got my own prime minister and my own president, but the French own my economy, so what the hell do I have? You see what I'm saying? The role of anti-communism. And that's why in the interview, I talked about the fact that in the leadership of many of the most advanced movements on the continent, including South Africa, by the way, the leadership of the ANC, because I knew them, were communists. Mm -hmm. O.R. Oh, Tambo, mm -hmm. Alfred Enzo, um, Chris Hani. There was no two ways about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Govin and I could name them. Walter Sus Nudicans. They were communists. Hence, the black people, quote unquote, we so black, Dr. Ben, Dr. This, all that mm -hmm. bullshit, uh, ancient Egypt crowd, you know, disliked and and fought against the African National Congress and did not embrace the African National Congress until the African National Congress became its opposite mm -hmm. and a pro-West kind of labor, uh, British Labor Party mm -hmm. formation. Then, oh, we love Mandela, we love the ANC. Well, hold it, y'all didn't, I mean, because I was, y'all didn't like them then. Right. You're running me out of places because I'm upholding the ANC. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm not making this up. So, Winston was prescient. He was courageous. 
And it is, a, I, I, I sometimes think of how difficult his life was. I mean, when I say difficult, I mean, not, you know, not like, you know, you run yeah. and hide yeah. and shit, but difficult in the sense of not being understood. Right. Yeah. Not being understood, not being appreciated among people that should appreciate yeah. you, you know, who, he saw what Du Bois saw. Winston had read Du Bois' world in Africa. Mm -hmm. He knew the centrality of Africa, both to the Western economies because of the great wealth in minerals. Today, that wealth in minerals, the great population, uh, and so on. He knew this. And if Africa, as a united continent, that didn't mean every nation, but more or less, could situate itself in the proper global alliances, then we could talk about the fight against neocolonialism. Alone, Africa, with all of these nations, which are too many, by the way, could not fight the West. Mm -hmm. right. The West had too much strength, financially, economically, militarily. And then, of course, Western intelligence had penetrated every government, and that's why all these assassinations. But then, in the Great Alliance, Winston foresaw the role of Black Americans and the Black movement as, as we would call it then, a rear base for the African independence movement. In other words, we don't exist to dictate who the leaders of, of uh, the People's Republic of the Congo, whatever. And as Winston, he always said it like this, we have to confront, as he put it, our own imperialism. Mm. And that's, that's really a heroic responsibility. Mm. But black, black, black people, you know, the so-called super black, change my name, put on a dashiki, talk that trash. You know, like I always say, have you changed your name because you're denouncing your mother and father? Mm -hmm. Did they change their names? Because I always want to know, now that you have a different name, well, who is your mother? Mm -hmm. I, I, maybe that's just an old school thing, wanting to know somebody's mother and father. But it is. It's a rejection of Black American history. Yeah. It, yeah. You, you know, you, you, feel, you know where I'm coming from. I do. And, um, but then they would leave Africa without allies fighting against the colonialist, imperialist powers that had enslaved Africans and colonized Africa. So Afrocentrism and Neo-Pan-Africanism is, in my own experience, which I just took, proved the point, are agents of neo-colonialism, gentrification. In fact, I'm talking too loud. The same Malefe Asante, who is way, supposedly, I'm more black than Tony. Tony ain't black enough. You know, he supported temple's building of a stadium mm. where the community resisted it. And three black women, two of whom I know very well, I think I know the third, went to visit him at his office to ask, why are you going against the community? He impolitely asked them to get out of his office and said they were nothing but agents of white Marxists. This is, I'm telling you, okay, all that's, you know, covered over, right? None of that's, and I keep trying to explain to people, somebody called me the other day, a Tony, it's, who should know? So I said, don't you know? Well, you know, I got ADHD and um, my memory ain't good no more. <laughs> but anyway, that's a whole nother. I mean, you should have known this. Yeah. 
This is basic. When a guy takes those positions, already it should raise red flags. Something else is going on here. What is, who are the forces that we don't see that for whom he is a puppet? Mm-hmm. You understand? And that's why understanding mm-hmm. political ideological relationships mm-hmm. is central to being, <laughs> I use the word, a activist, whatever the fuck that means, you know, being a, a, a political person at this time. That's what I wanted to say. So just, so Emil Carr and them, Emil Carr was not loved by the Afrocentrists and Neo-Pan-African. Marion and Guabe was not loved by these people. I can tell you this, they had no love for Modiba Keita. You know, how could you go through African Americans or Africana studies, Cornell, Temple, Harvard, you know, they talk about everything else, Africa this and ancient Kemet and Meru Neche and all that bullshit, you know. But don't, you never hear the name. Mm. Modiba Keita, first of all, a beautiful name, (laughs) you know. I was thinking if I was going to change my name to African, I might name myself Modiba Keita, man. And then the guy is super handsome. He looked, I said, wow. Just, yeah. I mean, if you think Obama's cute, I mean, what about Modiba Keita? You know? Oh, oh man. Guys, just unbelievable, man. But a man of dignity, a man of, of principle. Yeah, it, so, but you never hear, but you, you so African. But yes, there are all kinds of politics of Africa, and there is neo colonialist. Like, like Winston says, the ruling class is never divided along the color line. <laughs> he, you know, Winston, he had it so right. But anyway, I'll stop there. But we celebrate, or not celebrate, but we acknowledge the 50th anniversary of the assassination of one of the great leaders of Africa and of the world's anti-imperialist forces, uh, Amilcar Gabral. And like I said, I'm, I feel a certain sense of pride because he and his father from the same place that my father is from mm. in Cape Verde mm. and of the island of Brava. So I always felt a certain affection and connection to him for that, but deeper than that, the ideological, political connection. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to bring that up. I don't know if you have any comments or questions. I wanted to make a comment earlier <laughs> because you were talking about, who was it? I didn't check my notes. Yeah, you were talking about how black people in America, when they're being led by Afrocentrism, is basically yeah. just like a form of black supremacy, which stems from white supremacy. But I don't consider, I consider it a, black, a form of black subordination mm. under the guise yeah. of um, black pride. Mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Just like I tell you about Asante, the community fighting against a gentrifying university. He comes out supporting the university right. against the community, right. you know, but you, you, you super black, right. you know, they would come to the free school and they see this mix of people and say, well, y'all not black enough. Mm-hmm. I only want to be around black people, mm-hmm. to which I always ask what black people, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, cause all black people ain't the same mm-hmm. as is obvious, but I, I, I consider it for them of black subordination, of African subordination to imperialism. They prefer England over China or uh, France over the Soviet Union. Mm. You know, although China or Russia or the Soviet Union never enslaved or colonized any Africans. Right. I guess from, mm-hmm. from my definition was just the experiences I would have mm-hmm. of like, 
maybe late teens and leaving high school of mm-hmm. going down to like South Street on the weekends and mm-hmm. seeing people who like people call them hoteps. But like yeah, you were hotel, saying, yeah, they yeah, believe right. in Af- Africanology of anything that is black is what you should follow. But mm-hmm. a lot of the times when I've listened to these men speak, it just it just sounded like supremacy with like black skin because they said, oh, we need we need black schools, we need black this, we need mm-hmm. black this, and it's just mm-hmm. like you yeah. said, there's no ideological perspective Concept, behind yes. it. It's just the whole skin yes. theory of yeah. we want to be in charge, we want to like submit people to skin nation. Well, yes, you know, and we do need black schools. I'm, you know, no one is against black people building up organic institutions. Right. Nobody is against that. But don't appropriate it for its opposite. Exactly. See, you could you could say, I want to build up black institutions, and the purpose is to be subordinate to the white power structure. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, how am I subordinate to the white power structure? Well, first of all, you're getting all your funding from that. Right. So it's a black institution funded by white nonprofits. Yeah. So how black are you? Right. See, it's... it's See, they're there, and thus the ideological content. And they what they try to do is to empty everything of its ideological content and thus make it a skin question. Right. You did what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, you ain't black. You know, you ain't black enough. What do you mean I'm not black enough? Because your ide- ideology ain't black. Well, what is your ideology? My ideology is black pride. Well, black pride and ideology that has any deep significance in a world, you know, as we see it today. So it does become, it can sloganize for the purpose of subordinating, confusing, and misleading black people away from, this is what Winston was saying, away from the struggle against uh, your own imperialism. Right. And just one other thing. You see, it goes from, let us say, uh, 1960s, Black Pride, um, African identity. Then it keeps going towards Egyptology. And, uh, okay, then it goes further because it's it's just like every, just like with feminism, it's always something new. A new point, <laughs> but you never get close to the women's freedom, especially mm-hmm. the working class. Mm-hmm. So now the thing is that, like you call them hoteps, you know, and by hoteps, that means, you know, a uh, hotep means like when you speak to someone, it's supposed to be Egyptian language. Yeah. Hotep. hotep it's, it's supposed to mean peace. Like, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Egyptian. Okay, peace. Like hotep if I see. They say hotel. If I see, yeah, if I see queen, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, she's she's my queen. She just can't be my comrade. She's my hey queen. (laughs) Then she have to call me king. (laughs) Which is like because I'm not gonna lie, I understand the symbolism behind it. It's like this faint you're supposed to be uplifting another black I, person I as opposed to I just understand. like calling by their name but mm-hmm. when you when you pedestalize someone as a queen or a king like you said but they're not your comrade they're not your equal mm. they don't get a voice and you don't see them as human they're just mm. this sign of like and why, royalty. You want, why you want to identify with uh aristocracy anyway right that's what I said. It's like it so mirrors like white supremacy. Well, it is. It is. <laughs> you're, 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 you're absolutely. I, I would say yeah, it is a parallel. Because they even compare mm-hmm. so much absolutely of right. their right. structure to Europe. They're like, yeah. oh, we need yeah. this because that's what that's what white people have. Yeah. This is what white people have. Yeah. It's like, why are we trying? How are you saying we're separating ourselves from whiteness if everything you're trying to build? mirrors whiteness. Well, that's, and they mm-hmm. absolutely say that. They say, for example, you say, well, why are you going back to ancient Egypt? And by the way, they're going back to ancient Egypt carries with it a deep anti-Arab thing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. that the Arabs took over Egypt from mm-hmm. black people. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. And that's a whole that's nother a set of mm-hmm. issues. Yeah. But they say, well, our classical civilization is ancient Egypt. European classical civilization 
is ancient Greece and Rome. Yeah. So we're equal and we didn't know it because we have a, 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 an antiquity like they have an antiquity. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. However, there, at, but, but this is the fact, and this is Bernal in his three volumes points out that in fact, there was a civilizational vortex that included Egypt and Ethiopia, Ethiopia, but brought into it Greece and Rome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was not a, and, and then again, it was not racially yeah, divided. They, they didn't have that distinction. They did up. not. Marx's, oh, oh, good. Marx's favorite poet was Terence, who was an African poet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, like the, the classics just don't have this. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to say, well, two things quickly. To also add on to this, which is that Kwame Nkrumah, um, after he is uh, the coup happens and he's looking yeah. with Secretary, he writes this article, African Socialism Revisited, which yeah. I think will yeah. be related, uh -huh. Uh -huh. where it says, like, we well, you know the point is not to like return to ancient antiquity or mm -hmm. ancient civilizations in that sense, but it's rather the, the development. He talks about communism and socialism as a new possibility. And the question is the next development, and I, he's kind of politicizing against Senghor, I think was the first mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And so that that's like the one way in which this thing becomes conservative and romantic. But also off of what Chade was saying, somebody can be like, you can accommodate under the guise of positive self-assertion, yeah. right? That can be like a way, like, yes, I'm you know, very proud of everything. Mm -hmm. And politically, one can accommodate. And so, you know, I, I, I guess I bring that up because, like, it, it need not necessarily be, like, you know, Henry Winston has the critique of black capitalism as well mm -hmm. in that text mm -hmm. you're referencing, mm -hmm. which is even if you had all of the benefactors were black and were paying and that's the investors or something, one could still accommodate to world imperialism because yeah. world imperialism is not necessarily like a personality, like John imperialism, <laughs> but a thing, <laughs> right? And so consequently, one can accommodate out of like, oh, we're overcoming it because it's, I looked at the, basically the skin color of everyone who invests mm -hmm. in such, mm -hmm. such a fashion. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, because I always think when I read Kwame Nkrumah's like neocolonialism is that that's pointing back towards the West, meaning to the degree that we've made this revolution and in a sense you guys have not carried it on, continued it, then you're going to have like the French are monopolizing nickel in the Congo or they're dependent on the social insurance through um, COCO, mm -hmm. right? That was one of the ways in which mm -hmm. it was being funded. Mm -hmm. And it's pointing back, or Secretary, right? Wasn't he part of the CGT? Yeah. Right? And and yeah. France just tears out, you know, telecommunications when they leave. In other words, it's pointing back to the West, to America, to France. And, yeah. and that this is a world system. Yeah, and yeah. It works, and that, oh, I'm sorry. Please. No, no, that's all I was gonna no, say, no, no, yeah. no, this is very important. See, Winston, and see, this is what the black thing doesn't get or, or obscures yeah. is that we're dealing with a world system, yeah. as Winston would say, mm -hmm. a whole class of oppressors. Mm -hmm. And of course, Kwame Nkrumah's book, Class Struggle in Africa, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, he's, which he's substantively saying mm -hmm. that the struggle against colonialism, neocolonialism, elevates the class differences, struggle for independence, non, you know, you could say even antagonistic classes unite for political independence. But after political independence, the class divisions become more pronounced. That's what we see in that book. Yeah, well, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But yeah, but I guess, uh, I just, that's, if you don't mind, that's, I just wanted to bring those things yeah, out. Mm -hmm. Emil Carr, and we've talked about, we'll talk about them in the, um, in the event. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, forgive me. Yeah. Forgive me, Samir. Um, oh, it was on the, in regards to viewing Rome and Greece um, as part of Asia and Africa, I think it makes more sense because yeah. Rome had two wars with Carthage, which was a, African kingdom and you know that's taught but it's not really uh people don't really draw that line and also um I think there's the famous uh story of Alexander Alexander yeah. Cleopatra mm -hmm. Cleopatra is an African queen but she's mm -hmm. not really this goes to your interpretation of history do you interpret 
Cleop Cleopatra because she's a queen of Egypt uh, as a white person, or D Dido as a white person because she's yeah. a queen. That's because she looked at a Hollywood movie and she's Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> 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 Who's the British actress who played Cleopatra? Oh, no, Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but the, I uh, went to on Friday. I went to this uh, MLK uh, anti-NATO event at William Way. Mm -hmm. It was hosted by the Black Lives for Peace, mm -hmm. PSL, uh, International Action Center, mm -hmm. <laughs> and Anak Bayan was there. And, uh, uh, various other people, and uh, so I thought um, uh, I um, I don't know how to put this. I, I thought I'd go, and um, uh, uh, Gusto was facilitating, and um, she good, was facilitating the event. Uh, I guess she's part <laughs> member of Black Lives for Peace as well, and um, she opened up by attacking King by saying that by attacking like, who? Attack, yeah. Attacking King and who? Who was this? Gusto. because of um, she was she was saying um, that he was not old, a socialist, like he was a reformist, and then he became a revolutionary. And I I remember Doctor uh, Martin Day um, MLK Day. Um, or as Dr. C says, we should say his name. So Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King uh, day speech where he said that you know his dissertation was on Paul Tillich. He was a socialist from the beginning. He was a radical. He was interested in you know in pilgrimage to nonviolence. He was interested in these uh, radical ideas in German <laughs> philosophy. Um, but uh, then you know after that there was there was a break and there was pizza. And then the event got disrupted because of um, one person and maybe the support of other people uh, um, didn't uh, said that the event was harboring transphobia and homophobia. Wait, what? Um, what? Wait, what? And it's, it's because Pam Africa was supposed to be speaking, and oh. that move is uh, persona non grata, or Pam Africa is like made some statements that she hasn't walked back about trans people or, or gay people. And um, so it was, it was pretty sad. I thought I was there with Cindy and uh, the person started tearing down posters. There was a screaming match and Cindy got up and said, I worked six fucking hours on that poster. And I thought oh, there was going to be a fight. So, um, so that was uh, sad to see that. I was, I felt really bad for Gisso and Papa why, why did you feel bad for her? Because <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I wouldn't want that to happen to anybody uh, yeah. to get your event disrupted. Hmm. But uh, <laughs> I mean, people are against move now. So, <laughs> so, so are people against move now? Because I feel yeah. like every space I've been a part of is like no critical questioning of what move was, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm also not that. I'm not sure this. what's going on. There was a lot of drama. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on underneath the surface, or uh, uh, I haven't had the chance to ask Cindy what she thinks. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wanted to bring it back to the neo pan Africanist thing because I was thinking about this event mm -hmm. and the political tendencies and what that had, how that led to anti communism. Because these organizations, Black Lives for Peace, PSL, Workers World, they're explicitly you know, pro Soviet Union. Pro uh, communist. When did, when did they become pro Soviet Union? I, I, they're Marxists, so they're reformists, so whatever John Marcy broke from the Socialist Workers Party. Oh, for, yeah, uh, but, but, and, but that's a whole. I, I never, I mean, at least in my experience, I could not, I, I've never seen any evidence of a pro, quote, pro Soviet um, position all, of Workers World Party. All the young people that I mean, the reason young people are attracted to PSL is because they're just the party that supports the USSR. No, 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 no. They're, you mean Russia? Russia. Because they, they, by the time they came into existence, there was no more USSR. Right. Mm. I don't. But I'm just just. Workers Word is Marcy, where yeah. PSL is a split in the 2000s. Yeah. yeah, from the Marcyites, and how deep the split is is not clear. I'll put it that way. Right. Mm -hmm. But um. I mean, I guess people pivot really fast. I think this was what I, my lesson. And even um, Malefe Asante, because uh, I know that you helped him secure that 
position with the dean, it was a lesson to me that people pivot on their feet really fast. Um, but uh, to bring it back to the neo pan Africanism of the whole event, um, it be it's becoming clear to me the role of King in pan Africanism yes. because he was attacking the color line in the United States. Mm, right. And that's why he has to be smeared, degraded, even in event four, yeah. MLK Day, he has to be attacked on his own day. Yeah. Um, and um, it, it became clear at the platypus panel on work when that uh, black man from the Socialist Workers Party said that, you know, the the civil rights movement was attacking the color line mm. uh, in the United States. And attacking the color line is a victory for class unity. And um, that's that's the issue with those neo pan Africanists, you know, Billy Black Minds for Peace, is they're not interested in that cross racial class unity. Um, maybe an, an aesthetic, uh, they'll, they'll talk mm. about Fred Hampton or Martin Luther King. But as you said, the substance isn't really there. Mm. Yeah, this, this is sad to hear an attack. And you say King, she uh, positioned King as a... Against Malcolm X and yeah. as, 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 a, as a not socialist in the beginning. He wasn't, he wasn't born, he wasn't a socialist in the beginning. Um, and, you know, nonviolence wasn't really understood. Why have a King Day? <laughs> so, so Why have so, a celebration of Martin Luther King Day? Yeah, is, using his name. But let me ask so you. I say, was it in support of yeah, so, Well, event? they used Martin Luther King's day to attack Martin Luther King. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but see, this is this is what, Sophie, you say why? Yeah. You know, the why, I think the answer is, uh, to the why, is the who. Yeah. You see, who is doing this? Yeah. And I think that answers the question, why did it turn out like this? You, you get where I'm coming from? I guess it just seems so... I mean, I do understand it. I just... Yeah. wonder how people are so delusional yeah. that that's not yeah. yeah like what are we doing what are we know? doing mm -hmm. yeah. that was the spirit at the end of the event was to be <laughs> they dejected well, yeah. I, think, I feel like that's also just like a explanation though that a lot of those people don't have the ability to look inward yeah because that's like exactly what we're getting at with the whole like identification yep. with Pan-Africanism and the need for a black leadership, but it's really a misleadership and it actually pins you against the idea of unification and actually uniting as human beings because you get so hyper-focused on what you assume people's, um, what people's identities are and if, oh, they're not black enough. And it's like if they tune into people and their ideologies, but their skin happens to not be black, it's like, well, nobody wants to listen to that. And like you said, that's just all a product of the umbrella of the ruling mm -hmm. class and imperialism. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, there's so much divisiveness and division. Like the fact that a bunch of people who are for trans rights came and shut down that event and said, oh, it's, it's anti-trans or it's anti-LGBT. It's like, first of all, you can't do that. That's really unfair. Like I understand the need that everyone needs to be represented and not to disrespect people but you just walked into an event that had nothing to do with you and what you feel is important you know what i mean and like made it about you that's what i don't like about mm -hmm. these like mass movements of anybody it's like going to a space that literally did not speak about you at all did not ask you to be there and you just shut it down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's really Can nice I, stuff. I just say something and yeah. this is uh, to also address Sophie's question. You said why, I said the who. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and by the who, I meant the who in their political and ideological makeup. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, even the who of, well, where did you come from in the first place? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I have the benefit of being around Philly and being around the struggle so long. That I, you know, I can even ask for a resume. <laughs> Which, but the other, let me tell you something. Mark Lamont Hill, 
has uh, sponsored for five years, maybe six years, celebrations of Martin Luther King's birthday. Mm -hmm. I've been invited to several, only appeared at one. Mm -hmm. They were constructed. I, I, don't, I don't even have the words. I don't, it's mm -hmm. so, like, like you said, well, how could this happen? Where he brought in LGBTQ and trans people to attack King. Mm -hmm. If I'm lying, I'm crying. And I know the first one I had agreed. And I like Mark. I don't dislike Mark, but ideologically, don't pull me into nothing like this. I was, I was, I agreed. My name was already publicized. And I, I said, Mark, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I don't know who these people you got on this thing are. Mm -hmm. So he said, Tony, look, come on and do it. You don't have to be on the panel. You could give the keynote speech. Like that. I said, Mark, I can't. Mm -hmm. I can't. And then uh, I think the time that I did, I I said, look, Mark, because some ways I'm like a mentor to him. I said, Mark, the my condition for being on this is that I'm not going to participate in anything that attacks or quote criticizes King. Mm -hmm for being transphobic, homophobic, misogynist, all that nonsense, you know, using Barth and Michelle Foucault, uh, where he is what I say he is. Mm -hmm. And I went and I participated and it was a bad experience. And I don't want to go into the detail. It was nasty. Mm -hmm. Michelle was there. Even it got to the point where hands could have been drawn. Just like to think you were. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and made this. Well, I'll shut up. I'm like, but the question of who are these people? Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to know what your speech was. I want to know what your politics and ideas yeah, were yeah. going into the speech. Mm -hmm. And what is your history? Mm -hmm. Now, the young woman who was the moderator of this thing, she was at the event of the Church of the Overcomer. When when I spoke there, and to be honest with you, and you, you may have uh, detected this yourself, uh, Samir, you know, she, well, a lot of times, you know, I know a lot of times people are uncomfortable with the way I speak or that I'm speaking. But I'm, I'm looking at her while I'm speaking, you know, distracted, don't mean nothing to me. I know, well, you, you, you can't, first of all, you don't know this because you just got to this country. You've not studied our movement. So this arrogance and this, see, Black Alliance for Peace thing. Peace where? Yeah. Who's peace? Mm -hmm. What peace? And it's a fake title to call it a Black Alliance for Peace when they don't fight against their own imperialism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the measure. Frankly, you know, just to be honest and people looking, they can look, you know, Glenn Ford, who was my best friend. I love Glenn Ford, but near the end of his life, he was taking positions I would not support. Mm -hmm. For example, settler colonialism. Now, if we'd had time, we could have talked it out because that's our relationship. We didn't have, we could disagree without, as they say, being disagreeable. Mm -hmm. But he gave too much weight to a Jamal Baraka and this Black Alliance for Peace, which I, I saw the signs of a kind of neo, neo Pan Africanism. Mm -hmm. See, if it, the struggle for peace is the king conceptualization, mm -hmm. yep. 
The struggle for peace is inseparable from the struggle for civil rights and against mm -hmm. poverty. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, that's basic and it's understandable to ordinary people, mm -hmm. black, white, Asian, Latino. People can feel that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like what you say. Mm -hmm. And I learned, I get a lot of this in listening to uh, Emily talk about her union members. Mm -hmm. And what is our point? To move people against their own imperialism, mm -hmm. be it mm -hmm. in Ukraine or in Taiwan. The fight for peace ain't just a blip. See, and this, once you go there, okay, let's say we do have a Black Alliance for Peace, but then you must explain that the Black Alliance for Peace is for the unity, is mobilizing Black people in order to build unity right, right, of all right. forces fighting for peace. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And hence, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anybody that uses that name to attack Martin Luther King is literally politically almost committing a crime yes. against the people. Yes. That's what I'm saying. It's mm -hmm. not why. Okay. To answer why, you have to know who. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Emily. Yes. Uh, Emily? Well, because actually sorry. it was what you started out, like what you were saying about Amilcar Cabral and how pan like neo-pan-Africanists do not support the communists in Africa. It's interesting because when Samir brought up the King event, that's very interesting because it's exactly the same people who will not support the African communists who are also not support King. But it also shows that not only do you not see people like Amilcar Cabral or Marion Ngoabe as the rightful leaders of something that can actually overturn um, like neo-colonialism, imperialism, but also you don't see King as the rightful leader of a movement in America leading a whole map, preparing and leading like a rising people, giving them the capacity to overturn exactly overturn American imperialism, like I I feel like, I feel like that connection is very important because um, it also shows that you don't actually want yeah, American want imperialism no, to you don't be overturned. You don't, you don't actually, you benefit. Yeah. You're benefiting yeah. from upholding American yeah. imperialism. It's not just that you don't see it. I think it's actually that maybe you do see it and you don't want it. Like showing what exactly. side you're on, like yeah. who you actually are. And why is it that at the end of an event like the event Samir went to? you're leaving people maybe even worse off. You're not you're not ending a, an event raising yeah. the capacity yeah. of people or helping unleash the capacity of people to come together around a certain future mm -hmm. for peace or anything like that. You're actually dividing them. You're leaving them more confused, mm -hmm. like less likely to want to come together. And it goes against the whole manifestation of the civil rights movement. King, you know, um, like his speech about um, in a time to break silence. Okay. It's the whole point of the whole, if you listen to King speak, and this is what really frustrates me, it's like people mm -hmm. who really don't appreciate King, his leadership, his philosophy, his idea, like the ideological, political um, formulations he's making. The whole point is his speeches is he's like, he's helping the people under like their capacity to raise up to actually challenge American imperialism mm -hmm. in their own country. Like, you know, King is the father of this nation in the, in the same way that Marin and Goabe, yeah. you know, rising like all these people in the People's Republic of the Congo. Like if you see like the video um, in the documentary that Caleb and Murray and Emil made, like you see a people preparing themselves to not only overturn colonialism in their country, but to actually create a new like, you know, it's the proletariat. It's the proletariat creating like something new, like new economic and social relations. And you're seeing it unfold. And it's the same thing with King. And I feel like that's the connection. It's like that if you, it's the exact people who do not, who not only don't see King, but actually want to smash him down. Yeah. It's the exact people who also will want to smash down all the communist leaders in Africa. Um, and I think that's important. Like the connection you're making doc about um like anti-marxism is tied in with um i forget the other thing yeah you're saying like it's 
neo-colonialism, gentrification, Afrocentrism are intertwined. And what they have is like an anti-communism. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I guess it reminds me of Jeremiah's, like that article you wrote where you said, um, Baldwin makes, Baldwin has the central, makes a central point where he says, after you, uh, um, anti-communism is anti-black or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's so much, you know, the other thing is, it's so deeply uh, rooted in our struggle yeah. to act, and I, this is where I'm going with Nuri, everyone knows, or everyone who should know, knows this. So, but why are you then opposing this fundamental recognition that Paul Robeson was a communist, mm -hmm. Du Bois was a communist. So who are you attacking? Mm -hmm. King upheld Du Bois as a communist, supported him. He, is, he was a communist at the end of his life. So what is unusual about that, King would say. And when he took on American imperialism, you know, it's this is it's it's really grotesque, mm -hmm. and and uh, frankly, um, I like to know where she gets off talking like that. And don't tell me about no poor people's army. That don't get you off of the hot seat. You are responsible for your words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And someone who knows better was listening to you. This is this is shameful. One of the great leaders assassinated like that, and you all still yeah. attacking him? Mm -hmm. Come on, get mm -hmm. the fuck out of here. Mm -hmm. It's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. It's unacceptable, especially at this crucial moment. Yeah of inflection as they call it in world his, world history. Whew. Anything else to say on this? There's a few <laughs> comments. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Let's <laughs> <I'm> try <trying> to <laughs> read through quickly. Um, so you came your first day back, you start and try. No, I just, <laughs> I'm only joking. Yeah, right. I've never heard you first before. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff messes me up. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone named Fred Red 50 asks, does Idi Amin also count as a character in Idi Amin. Idi Amin, yes. Does, oh, does he yeah. also count as a character assassinated genuine freedom fighter? I don't know who that is. Well, I think that's a, not a serious question, first of all. Um, we're not talking about Idi Amin or every personality that has risen to leadership, governmental leadership in every African country. Uh, so that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the main direction of the anti-imperialist struggle on the African continent, and we're talking seriously. And I, for one, don't appreciate unserious people trying to interrupt a serious conversation. Um, and then Wade Patton, who commented earlier, says, um, race essentialists are naturally entrenched in liberal democracy because it preserves and intensifies race conflict Communism, however, threatens essentialists with peace and the resolution of racial conflicts and continues. From my personal experience, trying to reach out to essentialists with an appeal to peace, reparations, justice, and equality is usually resisted for the politics of role, re role reversal, resentment, and vengeance. And I do have, I have a question related to this. Do you think that it's possible for liberalism to survive without inevitably implementing racism in self-preservation. No, I, I don't, he's asking the question of classical liberalism. And of course, you know, one must see all of these uh, ideological and political phenomena in their historical development. Uh, 
and, and of course, you know, how, how to put it, um, in other words, what has historically evolved has linked liberal liberalism, a liberal theorizing, a liberal politics mm -hmm. with the system of imperialism and mm -hmm. the color line. And that's mm -hmm. why Du Bois makes the statement, the problem of the 20th century, He's saying the political problem, the problem of democracy in the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Mm -hmm. And so I would just say the great democratic theorist of the 20th century is W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, that's what I, I just. Okay. And then Jahan adds uh, some context saying that um, it seems that Africa is returning to a struggle for sovereignty, taking advantage of the rising multipolarity. I've noted this trend in the governments of Mali, Central African Republic, yes. and Ethiopia. These governments have turned to Russian military and Chinese economic assistance to strengthen their state sovereignty against France and against U.S.-backed rebels and religious extremists. Um, it seems like this quote-unquote super Afrocentrism is also an attempt to divide Africa along skin tone, since these people want to cut off sub-Saharan Africa from the revolutionary movements in North Africa. They consider North Africans in Egypt, Algeria, and Libya as quote-unquote settlers and support imperialist attacks on the revolutionary movements in those countries. This is a further division of African unity, and they also take a similar attitude against Asian states and movements. These left parties became pro so oh, he's talking about like workers' world and, and stuff, but he's saying that these left parties became pro Soviet after 1991 when it became after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yeah, unit. when it became more convenient. Mm -hmm. um, and then Ron Frazier on Facebook said, uh, he's just quoting you. Um, he agrees with your point about. Um, Glenn, Glenn Ford taking mm. positions that you would, I think it was Glenn Ford, taking positions you wouldn't support, giving too much weight to a Jami Baraka mm -hmm. and Black Alliance for Peace, mm -hmm. um, and basically not recognizing that the struggle, which doesn't recognize that the struggle for civil rights is a struggle against poverty. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then one last question. Yeah. Amadi Ajamu says, point of clarity, was the Black Alliance for for peace taking a position against MLK because he wasn't communist? And what does the ML and what does the LGBT community have against MLK? Mm. Um, I don't know, maybe Samir <laughs> yeah, can clarify. Can I just say one thing? Uh, just say hello to Ron Frazier. Um, and um, uh, to um, and others can can come in on this too. Um, you know. You know, a lot of people are trying to create uh, new banners under which to march, new labels, new brands to define themselves. The same people who maybe a year, a year and a half ago, were marching under the banner of LGBTQ rights are now marching. Since that banner may not may not have the same uh, attraction as it once did. Now they march under a new banner of uh, Black Alliance for Peace. Mm -hmm. But the I, I would say to, um, and you know, Mahdi would understand this, it is the political essence that we're trying to capture and understand because the alignment of forces in the United States is also predicated upon a certain ideological clarity. And when these so-called, I put quotes here, radical activists with no histories, you know, of any kind of activism, civil rights, peace, or whatever, when they then become a spearhead to attack the historic movement that has to be recovered in this time if we are to move forward. Mm -hmm. When that happens, then we're in a different situation. It is a situation of, let us say, a Malefe Asante uh, uh, calling out Montero because he is a communist apparatchik, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. This is where we're at. 
And um, yeah, I'm sorry. Go go ahead, though, Jerry. So just just to add to build on what you're saying, I think mm -hmm. part of the problem is that if like people like Casso or Black Lines for Peace, I feel like there is a lot of times like an opportunism also with with, with regard to King, where mm -hmm. it's like it's like people like these groups will have their own agenda and position and all these things that they're trying to push. And maybe sometimes it will feel this opportune to go looking for a King quote that affirms mm -hmm. our own position and you're just using King for that purpose. But I think if the criticism of King is that he was a reformist, then it's almost like you are taking, it's almost like you are believing what the ruling class is saying mm -hmm. about King and you're taking that as your own position and saying like, oh, like my problem with King is that he was a reformist, a liberal, all mm -hmm. these things. But like, that is what the ruling class is trying to tell the people about King. And you're, mm -hmm. it's like, you're using that position as like mm -hmm. your framework for understanding him when it's actually like, like if you try to understand King on his own terms and not on terms set by the ruling class, then like it leads you to the, the kind of conclusion that we've developed over the years in free school, which is basically looking at King as the model of a revolutionary in the United States. And um, and I think it's just, yeah, a lot of it is like you're basically taking the ruling class's bait in terms of how they're trying to define the situation, how they're trying to define King. And, and yeah, a lot of it is just, it's kind of sad, but even in terms of like the event that Samir described, I think it is very characteristic of a lot of the kind of like the, the left because it's like, you know, they're trying, on the one hand, they're trying to take a position which they think is radical, but then it's like all of these movements ultimately are kind of eaten up by them. Like they eat themselves up and there's always, there's always, there's all these splits. There's all this, like basically people attacking each other all the time. And like, I feel like that is kind of the story of like, whether it's like workers world party splitting into PSL, splitting into another thing. Can I just say but, one thing? Yeah. You know, if, if you don't mind yeah, no, just no, no, no. interrupting and then I know Nuri, you know, there is, you know, every judgment or assessment uh, has to have a certain uh, foundation, a certain criteria. For instance, if I say mm -hmm. that the Workers' World Party pursued ultra-leftist sectarian politics from the beginning, then I have to say, well, what would be the alternative? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to that, to sectarian, ultra-left yeah. mm -hmm. politics. So one, right. history, context, and movement. Mm -hmm. Now, you can shout all day long, I'm for the working class and the I'm a revolutionary socialist. But who were the people in Montgomery, Alabama? Mm -hmm. Who, mm -hmm. who were the people in Memphis, Tennessee? Oh, I mean, the working class at the end of the day was the base of King and remains so yes. today. Mm -hmm. It's not at the university. It's not in these left organizations. Mm -hmm. The broad working class. Just, just one more thing, Dan. Um, so I would say, wait a minute, don't come out in 2023 talking about we're going to have a Martin Luther King Day when all the rest of the time you've been arguing that King was an assimilationist, yeah. a reformist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a tool of liberal capitalism and whatever else you could find to call him. Mm -hmm. Don't come up now. It's too late. Yeah. It is too late damn late yeah. you've done the damage you know and then you're going to march against the war in Ukraine beautiful thing I'm down but hold on what about the day after the march mm -hmm. what do you, who are you now mm -hmm. is it a sincere or an insincere march and and they're conflicted because King is the criteria. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they're conflicted. You see what I'm saying? 
Where you stand on King will tell me where you stand on any number of other questions. Mm -hmm. And by that, I don't mean, see, King is complicated where you stand on King. Of course you get like the Congressional Black Caucus, oh, we love King, mm -hmm. you know, or John Lewis, King, King, King. But you're not, you, you betrayed King. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. My point is, see, people say we're gonna we're gonna have a thing on the radical king. When was he not radical? Yeah. Believe me. I, yeah. I, that was the line. Yeah, the radical king. Well, first of all, are you radical? Mm -hmm. First of all, <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. just so many questions. That's why the why is also involved with the who. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, let me let, let me let Nuri and then um, and then Danny. Danny. No, go ahead, Nuri. Because well, I feel like Danny. I feel like Danny will say something more general that'll help me clarify. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess what I was trying to think was that the only real basis by one in my this is my opinion. So maybe everybody will disagree with this. The only real basis by which one, and I, I think I'm following you, yes. that one could even give a, a critique of historical revolutionaries is you would have to go beyond them in theory and practice. Right. Mm -hmm. Meaning it's very easy to just like sit here and read somebody's works and be like, oh, they didn't mention LGBT. So they're yeah, right, right, you know right, what I mean? Right, right, I mean, right. the only way that you would actually really be able to grasp the limits and it's not a limit out of any individual fault. It could be like, in other words, why does Martin Luther King continue to task us today? Because the whole thing wasn't fulfilled. Yeah. And the only way in which one could even get at that limit is you would have to recover such a revolutionary Absolutely. moment and then go beyond it in theory and practice. Meaning, but, but isn't but, that interesting? But that, that, that's, yeah. I just wanted to comment that, no, no, on that. No, no, that's no, no, also, no. you want to know why I'm like a scholastic, quote unquote, <laughs> regarding Lenin and Marx? And because I know, man. in a <laughs> sense, that they have a whole experience that I don't have. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So I actually try to be humble in the face of them and not try to be like, oh, I know better because blah, 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 there's computers now. And <laughs> <a computer. laughs> that's a dumb thing. So, and, and what one ends up doing is they affirm the history they actually, they close, they close down on Martin Luther King and they affirm the history since then, mm -hmm. meaning they're holding themselves as above King yeah. and therefore yeah. they're affirming actually really the liquidation in that part. So that's all I wanted to say. No, that's, that's very, oh, well, let me let Nuri, but I, I agree. No, 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 Nuri, please, please, I'm well, talking too much. That kind of also goes back to this thing about the artist and the critic, mm -hmm. where like if the critic supersedes the artist and it's like you're just criticizing, but you don't actually have anything to create or to actually like, I guess, go like bring the artist to the present. Instead, it's just sort of refuting and being like, oh, that was in the past. That's bad. We're so much better now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like the it kind of goes to this whole thing about the dialectic between like the artist and the intellectual, like the artist and the audience. Um, but I think the original thing that I was going to say is that I think this anti-communism thing was really deep. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's easy to sort of do like a knee-jerk thing of like, oh, anti-communism, yeah, it's bad. Like, oh, like the McCarthy era, like it was really bad. But I think it is insidious mm -hmm. and has actually, like, it's a big deal. Like, it's really serious. Um, mm -hmm. And I think part of the problem is that you are anti-communist without knowing what communism is. Like just say, like using it as a smear. Mm -hmm. And I think also all of these efforts mm -hmm. to, yeah, like basically try to split communism from all of the things that it has supported, like labor, democracy, like the peace movement, and then sort of isolating it as yeah, a separate pieces. thing. Mm -hmm. And that also goes to the thing of like the radical king and all of this thing of like, oh, like who actually was king? Like which part of king is the yeah, radical king? Exactly. Which part of king is the communist king versus like the reformist king? <laughs> and it's, yeah, I, I just think that it is a huge disservice because all of, yeah, like even being in Korea and like thinking about the national liberation movement, like the independence period and trying to think about how South Korea tries to make sense of that period because it's a fact that there were a lot of like socialists in the movement mm -hmm. and a lot of those people yeah like ended up in the north and in the south you have to try to hide away that history or to try to sort of neutralize it mm -hmm. and i feel like even today with like the national security law like you're not allowed to say anything praising the north or like pro-communism because then it's like it's understood that even that idea is basically an attack yeah. on the South Korean state. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so it's just interesting, but really sad to think mm-hmm. about yeah. because you're not supposed to try to understand like why were people driven to become communists in the first place? Mm-hmm. And this thing that it mm-hmm. is in essence about trying to go to the people and to actually understand the people and to lift up the people. And so, yeah, I just think like this anti-communism idea is much more serious than I think I'd originally like mm-hmm. considered it because of the way that it gets used um, to like, I guess, distract from like what the actual point of things are. And then also among the left, like you have all these people arguing about like, oh, like mm. who's more left, who's more communist, mm. who's actually a radical. <laughs> yeah. And then you're not actually talking about what the point Absolutely. of any of it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Kale, okay, go ahead. Man. Uh, I'm still thinking. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm always bothered by going to like these different leftists meetings or like more or like demonstrations because I feel like that's the, the sort of script that happens every time a collection of people get together and want to do something they don't really know what that is exactly and people really genuinely mm-hmm. want to do something good mm-hmm. and it gets disrupted people leave defeated people mm-hmm. leave these groups and these groups dissolve and then reform again or they split and it's this I feel like it's this lack of seriousness mm-hmm. but it's also this sort of tactical opportunism where a lot of people take where mm-hmm. no one's going to go against King really but then they, yeah. they 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 still rhetorically go against them, but like mm-hmm. not actually taking them mm-hmm. as like a seed seriously. Yeah. It's this sort of thing of just you know where you came with and how molded it into like Jeremiah said the agenda mm-hmm. they have already. It's like if King was here, he'd be a uh, you know democratic socialist <laughs> or he'd support our group. He'd be here, you know, agreeing with me and you know what we're doing. So he'd be for Bernie or anything like that. And it's mm-hmm. it's, uh, I, it's not yeah yeah it's I don't know I mean it, it's. I'm still trying to put the pieces in my head, but it's, it's this thing of people want to do something and they think like this history is there and they take up this history and then they just, they just store it in ways that just, you defeat yourself in that way too. Mm-hmm. It's almost self-defeating and people don't know that it's self-defeating and they go through this cycle of like, the left turns out so many depressed and anxious and destroyed young people mm-hmm. where like it's a machine that almost takes in like the hope to do good, but then produces people who, ultimately think that nothing is possible because like the horizon gets lower and lower and lower yep. and so there's nothing that can be done people feel yeah. i feel like well because the funny thing is that i was also besides the events in the thought but i was also thinking about the psl mm-hmm. king day march where mm-hmm. i was very there's there's a bit of movement to just use king as a peace person but it's mm-hmm. like what neri said where it's like yes peace great But why are you separating peace from America's revolutionary tradition, the working class that made up, the black working class that made up the movement at first and then brought into like a whole mass of American people? Why are you separating from labor? All this stuff. And what's funny is that PSL didn't have to have a King March. They could have had a like a march on any other anniversary, right? Any birth anniversary you wanted. But you chose King. Why? Because you know King is popular. No, it's because you know that King is important to people. Mm -hmm. So I like what you said where you're like, people are conflicted. It's like, you're conflicted because you know that King, having a King Day, like a Martin Luther King Day in itself, says something. Like, people fought for it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just, it wasn't a pure appropriation or capitulation to, like, whatever, the Democratic Party, whatever. It's, like, Martin Luther King Jr., like, you know you have to have a King Day march or you know you're gonna get the most attention because Martin Luther King Jr. to this day is important to people. So it's a conflict where you're simultaneously trying to use his legacy to this day because working people remember him. And then at the same time, you're like, okay, how do we take only just a part of King and use it for our agenda? Yeah. And, yeah. and and it goes back to like, I think what we've been talking about in free school, even with like how we're understanding the civil rights movement as a third American revolution, yeah. because people don't, people want to take what they can from King or from the civil rights movement or from the black freedom movement. Like, you know, people want to take like the radical parts of the civil rights movement or the <laughs> radical figures from the civil rights movement. But you don't want to actually understand the civil rights movement as such an, like such an important and nation changing mm-hmm. uh, like event, movement, movement. movement. And yeah, that's interesting because I was I was really shocked by, I think I already said this in free school, but I said it again, where 
I really did believe that maybe people have forgotten King. And it shocked me so much when like, because on, on one hand you have PSL who's having like a King Day March, but really it's not, they didn't really talk about King's life. When I watched the program, they were mainly talking about like, um, King was against war, white supremacy and poverty. And we're now we're like pivoting to talking about like peace in Ukraine and stuff, but you didn't talk about King at all. You didn't, like, and, but then on the other hand, I had members in my union say like, we want to go on strike on Martin Luther King Jr. Day because, and then the, um, the president of that chapter told me she was like, she's a black woman from Philly. And she said, I think about King every day. And I wonder what he felt. I think about how he felt every day. Like in the darkest moments of his life, I wonder how he got through. Yeah. And then she like talked about Jesus and she was like, I talk about Jesus every day too. Mm-hmm. You know, there's like people have been changed by the civil rights movement. The American, mm-hmm. like it's what we've been saying where the American people today, mm-hmm. if you want to ask who they are, why they are the way they are, everyone from the Trump supporters to mm-hmm. the people across Pennsylvania, white and black. Mm-hmm. Like I also love the stories Alice talks, like tells about Reading because her family has a restaurant in Reading where it's like, it's Reading is a poor city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so white and black, it's not so different. And it's actually the same in Pennsylvania too, where it's exactly that people are so poor that there's intermixing. Like there are all most couples in poor areas. It's like white and black. Mm-hmm. Usually, in my experience, it's usually a black man and a white woman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like, I think you were saying this, Alice, it's like the white woman, it's like they're not even offended when the black person says, I hate white people because the white woman's like, yeah, me too. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's like an interesting, like it's not ideological white supremacy does not exist like that. And yeah, part of it is, I think also part of it. Could you amplify upon that? Because I think this is a foundational sociological Mm -hmm. observation Mm -hmm. that you, you, you told it more, you, you teased it out a bit, where the, where the black man said, I hate white people. And his girlfriend said, yeah, I do too. And then a white guy comes in and is the best friend of oh, the yeah. black man that said he hates white people. Yeah. And, he says, I, and, the, and the white guy says, I hate him too. You know? So here we, I mean, to the audience, go ahead, Alice. I mean, I'm just so <laughs> Um, well, the context is, in addition to, well, the context is that my family owns a like Chinese takeout restaurant. What is the and, name of it again? Like Happy Family. Happy <laughs> name <laughs> 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 that in China. <laughs> uh, but it's really, I mean, there's one dimension which is like an immigrant Chinese in a neighborhood such as that. Um, and I mean, Chinese takeout restaurants also being where a lot of like poor working class yeah. people frequent. Yeah. And so it's something that I never really understood until free school because I used to go to Reading pretty often. And there's a separation that happens for immigrant families to say, like, oh, like we're a business and everything, we're just trying to make money. Mm-hmm. And the world around the restaurants is like, you don't touch it. It's yeah. like really poor, um, like, People have problems pro- uh, with drinking, with um, drugs, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but the area that my aunt is in, it's like mainly like poor, white, black, Latina. Um, but there's this one day, and you see a lot of contradictions, which is like even in that interaction with the younger black men, where he comes in, he is with his white best friend, and on his phone, he's talking to a white woman. And he's actually very like demeaning to the white woman. Mm. Um, but you can kind of tell that they have like they're in a relationship. Uh, so first of all, he's like interacting with my cousin who's taking his order. And he's like on the phone with this white woman saying like, you know, like um, they say like the Chinese um, uh, brought out like the, it's in relation to COVID and uh, China. <laughs> but you know what? Fuck America. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wait, wait, no, he was like, you know what they say about my Chinese brother? He's like talking about my cousin who's taking the order, <laughs> like about my Chinese oh, brother. And then that's when he gets into oh. that thing. And then um, he's like on the phone with like uh, this white woman. And then like, it's really interesting because he brings up stuff about Hebrew, Israel, like Israelites. Hebrew. And you can probably like, that's 
like you know the stuff that we were talking earlier about Kyrie and Kanye mm-hmm. probably mm-hmm. also like he mm-hmm. listens to mm-hmm. um but you also see that sort of uh almost schizophrenia as well where mm-hmm. it's like they are clear about like I, I guess Kanye uh, specifically they say things that are really clear and make you think but there's also sides mm-hmm. of them where you can like see some sort of mental illness yeah. um as well uh and but yeah he's like talking to this woman and he's like fuck you white people <laughs> and she's just she's just listening and then doesn't really respond to him um but i think in that interaction i think it helped me to reevaluate a lot of things that i had avoided as a younger child um and also particularly from an immigrant family of not um relating to the poor uh people in that community mm-hmm. um but yeah that was like i think i don't think i'm missing oh well there are some <laughs> things that i'm missing that i won't say on live stream yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but yeah because mm-hmm. uh, uh i know emily and i she was telling me the story and i i didn't oh, maybe I mixed up the yeah no 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 because it because i think you were relating it to experiences in your union yeah you know you go into especially outside of big urban areas black and white poor people live together yeah 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 and hello oh. and this you know this is sociologically very significant because the question is living beside each other but then what do they think of each other mm-hmm. because they're different meanings mm-hmm. than would be the case if you didn't, if you lived separate, like mm-hmm. in Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. There are hardly uh, neighborhoods that I know of yeah. where black and white people, mm-hmm. even poor people, live together like that. So a different set of meanings emerge mm-hmm. from that sociological fact. And it's mm-hmm. worth. Um, Okay. And so uh, go, going forward, then when, when you add the ideological, mm-hmm. uh, okay, social, when sociologists say the ideological variable to the sociological fact, black and white poor people living together and seeing themselves as the same, you know, in other words, yeah, I could see you're white, I could see you're black, but with with the same yeah. type of thing. But then you add to that, okay, in this case, the young man uh, to explain the world went to Hebrew Israelism, but then probably at some point he would also go to King. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I'd be interested in, do they go to the same churches? We don't know. But all of these are, are sociologically, as, as per our concept, and, I, and you said it in your essay, it says a new nation is not, something about it is already being mm-hmm. forged. It is not something that we're waiting for it to happen, mm-hmm. it is already happening. Mm-hmm. I think it's very, very important. Let, let me let me just call on Danny and then and I'll say I, 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 I know I guess we're not touching on black reconstruction today, but I'll I'll give the one relation to it, yeah. which is I'm gonna so four chapters from this book. Chapter one, he talks about in 1860 that uh, at the time of the war, black people in America, if you looked at their genetic background, there were a lot of black people who had Native American, Absolutely. white, something like that. Chapter two, mm-hmm. when he's talking about the cults of mountain boomers, I think he's quoting somebody else. It would have been Appalachia. Mm-hmm. Again, he says something similar. He says, if you look at the genetic background, right, so the difference in the category black and white versus the, the genetics yes. of poor whites, they would also have, you know, some background of Native Americans, mm-hmm. Negro blood, mm-hmm. different things like that. Mm-hmm. And then we just read a chapter, the transubstantiation of the poor white. <laughs> and I guess I, I bring Excuse up, me, of a poor white. Of a poor white. <laughs> yeah. Okay, of a poor white. Yeah, oh, did I think of the chapter wrong? But maybe this might be No, 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 yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because it's one, of the, it's one of these things that it's like throughout the whole text when I'm reading it, 
there's always this kind of non-identity of the categories of black and white that they're both kind of true and false meaning true as in they're emerging as social things yes. but also false that like you know the the poor whites will be like am i really white or i'm yeah. not yeah. And so it's like a substantiation thing yeah. and it's yeah, kind of that's like, baldwin right, that's right baldwin you know say you know you know what you're seeing is not always what is right this is so important in oh go ahead i'm sorry no, i was going to say <laughs> just hearing the stories right now it's like that's and i know also in the south post civil war there was a lot there was like more or maybe it's probably post civil rights that there today there's more interracial marriage in the south than there is in the north i didn't know that uh this is something spencer usually relays to yeah. me and that's good but the reason mm -hmm. i bring that up is because it's one of these things that on the one hand like on immediate face value maybe it wouldn't make sense to us but actually maybe it does when you would have a white person say have white people or something mm -hmm. like that we're not identifying that way because it's always it's always kind of been an ideological weapon in that sense and so there's always been this thing of the falseness of it that's right right but see this is the the invention of the color line right the invention of the color line uh, what's the book how the irish became white oh yeah yeah right yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's <laughs> yeah, but let me let me call on Seraphine. I'm sorry, dude. No, 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 no. I didn't have a big time at all. But I, mean, I don't know the churches in Reading, but the overcomers are a good example. Yeah. Oh, and yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. What we're seeing there in the overcomer. Yeah. And, and I would say, interestingly, some would say, ironically, the nation of Islam. Because, I, you know, with all these. <laughs> Asians, sure. Southeast Asians, Cambodians, Vietnamese, and Chinese, and I'm certain Koreans joining the nation of Islam. Mm. And no one could have predicted it. Because I asked people, did you guys see this? They said, no, no. And if the Asians are joining, how far behind are the poor whites? Mm. You know what I'm saying? And I can tell you, this is why uh, Louis Farrakhan has to be given so much credit. It is a different nation of Islam today mm. than in the first resurrection. Mm. And, uh, oh, oh, go ahead, <laughs> go ahead. It's, it's not completely. Uh, go for it. Uh, um, well, okay, Virginia Cotts has a comment saying that Dr. King pulled this country out of the McCarthy period. That's true. I, would, I think. Oh, forgive me for I don't need to. No, I mean, I mean, just to agree with Virginia, because I think mm -hmm. King does not get enough credit for the extent to which he struggled against not just the color line, but yeah. also anti communism. That's right. That's right. That's and right. And he says that most explicitly in the speech honoring Du Bois, mm -hmm. but also in the like Time to Break Silence speech. And I think. To make it even more concrete, I think it's important to think about how like all of this affects something like the Trump movement, because one of the, you could say, weaknesses of the Trump movement is that they still buy into a lot of the anti-communism, anti-China yeah. anti -China stuff. stuff. But it's interesting because like the, the point yeah. that was brought up earlier about anti-communism affecting the capacity of a people to struggle That's right. you see it play out in the trump movement because mm -hmm. the way mm -hmm. that they think is like mm -hmm. okay i'm against the ruling class i'm against the government but then then it tugs on their basically like mm -hmm. their libertarian instincts yeah. mm -hmm. which is what du bois calls like the american assumption mm -hmm. of like anyone can make it in the society but like in, a, in the most concrete sense it pulls them away from what the Trump movement could become, which is like an actual people's movement, mm -hmm. because then it, it pulls them away mm -hmm. from any, from what they think is like, I don't know, like con basically consolidation, like growing closer and growing more united as a movement. And like, I only got this from my like, talking with my dad, but you see it even in someone like Tucker Carlson too. Oh, definitely. We're like yeah. night by night, he's attacking the deep state. He's attacking the ruling class, yeah. but basically saying, oh, this is about like basically the US government has become communist. And this is like, mm -hmm. like if you read any of like the, like the news sites, which are really big amongst the Trump movement, like there's one called American greatness. Mm -hmm. That's actually pretty good. Um, but 
like all of the comment sections where you have like hundreds of people commenting because like these are actually very well read it's like they're all basically saying like oh yeah it's a communist government that we have and stuff like this but it's like it's not even so much about the label of communism as it is about like as much as king did in terms of struggling against the color line and anti-communism it is still true though that the the, to the extent that anti-communism still remains a force in American social life, like it is the most attractive in terms of like the fact that it prevents people from actually like wanting to engage in a united struggle. And I think that is one of the primary reasons why it's important to take up King even more strongly today, both because it's like there's the possibility to complete what the civil rights movement started, which is basically the remaking of relations amongst all of the American people. But also it is directly addressing like, do the American people want to struggle? It's like, if you're so against this government, which you think is like basically a ruling class cabal, it's like, you're not going to solve that by just like doing your own thing, mm -hmm. right? But that is like, ultimately like, you know, Emily talks about it. It's like people just kind of like bunker down you know, like, I'm just going to sit this out. But it's like, you're not going to overcome any of these problems just by, like, doing your own thing. But that is, it's like, that's one of the ways that people are, like, pulled in that direction. Um, and, and but, you yeah. know, this, oh, I'm sorry. See, this is, okay, now we're transitioning oh, yes. a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> sorry. That, oh, okay. No, wait. Sorry. Mm. No, wait. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, See, the question is that American politics, first of all, I don't think there's two ways to look at it. The American people are more politically engaged, that is politicized, than any time maybe in the 20th century. People, and that doesn't mean everybody. I mean, but when you take the whole population, there is greater politicization, greater um looking at things through lenses of politics and power mm -hmm. and not just quote culture or identity this is where trump is going to have to make a strategic decision mm -hmm. which is does he run as a republican with all of the constraints, and if I were to say it right now, he would have less of a chance of winning as a Republican than he would as an independent. You see what I'm saying? A movement mm -hmm. which is unconstrained by uh, the NRA, the uh, evangelical leaders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, but Trump can begin to shift the balance because see what they're holding on, like you said, the American assumption about whiteness. Mm -hmm. Henry Winston said that anti-communism and racism are inseparable, they're twins. Mm -hmm. You can't really fight racism and be an anti-communist. Mm -hmm. Now there are a lot of reasons for that. I mean, it's not just one reason, but we won't yeah. get into it now. But I, I, I can see very much what you're saying. It is a deficit yeah. and lowers the capacity of the Trump movement. But then I'll tell you another thing. That in itself lowers the possibility of Black people joining the yeah. Trump movement because Black people have an aversion yeah. to anti-communism. That doesn't mean every Black person. Yeah. But it's not something, it's not a default position. Oh, the Chinese gave us COVID. Mm -hmm. you, you don't hear that among black people. Because we don't, I mean, China, they ain't white. Mm -hmm. Then you get all kind of other things, Asiatic black people, you know what I'm saying? Any, but we have we have seen China as a liberating force because they liberated themselves. And then, of course, for black people, if the white establishment, as we say, the white man is attacking them, we feel it must be something good about them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a crazy, I often say, 
you know, black people is very, you know, in one sense, ironic, satiric, funny, you know what I'm saying? You know, just like um, Alice said about her aunt's thing. Yeah, baby, I love you to death, but I hate the white man. <laughs> and the white, you know, it's it's so. But it's I could see it very just as you said it. To the extent that the Trump people keep espousing that nonsense, mm -hmm. to the, they can't make the kind of shift right. towards black people. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, because the most interesting, one of the really interesting parts about that, like Tucker monologue that you mentioned, where he talks about how the deep state took down Nixon. How the CIA. The CIA. Did, why don't you tell, did anybody see that on Tucker? No. Maybe tell, tell a little bit about well, that. Well, okay, know. I think it was like two nights ago where Tucker did this monologue where he was basically trying to understand and explain why right now there's this whole controversy around Biden's classified documents that he was yeah, storing, yeah. which is basically yeah. how they were trying to take down Trump a few months ago, but now it's coming around to bite Biden. And he's basically making the assertion that it's like the ruling class like doesn't want Biden to run again in 2024. Yeah, yeah. And so that's why they're trying to bring him down with this scandal because they don't think that he's useful anymore. Mm -hmm. But he compared it to when like he brings up all this evidence to support like the argument that this is also how it's similar to how the CIA and people who are directly involved, first of all, in the cover up of the JFK assassination, how they then took down Richard Nixon through the Watergate scandal and basically saying like, who was Carl Bernstein before like he was a Washington Post reporter. I think he was saying he was like some like some some Maybe involved person that we don't know why he left. Yeah, like some involvement with like the the military and stuff. Um, Watch yeah. the movie Nixon by Oliver Stone. <laughs> yeah, I, I just like the movie, but I just okay, yeah, I yeah. Too. but um, <laughs> but yeah. So he was basically talking about all this stuff, but then the interesting, really interesting thing was when he was saying like, also like this is connected to COINTELPRO, but it's like it's like all this really interesting stuff where it's like. To talk about COINTELPRO is to talk about the attack yeah. on the Black Freedom Movement. Yeah. He, he, he tried yeah. to, uh, right. to say that it was an attack upon dissidents. Right. And that, but that's, that's right. But like, and so it's like, but like, it's like, yeah. like all of these, like logically, all of these things take you to like the Black Freedom Movement and to yes. King. But it's like you still have this ideological yeah. barrier in front of you, which is like, it, like, it's like instinctively, it's almost like they have to pull away from it. But it's like still like you because of the logic of like where you're going, you're still pulled towards it. And like that's like the interesting thing where it's like like because talk like Tucker is like literally the most watched man in America. Yeah, like yeah. millions upon millions of Americans, whether they're even the rep Republican or Democrat, like they watch him. And like it is on the one hand incredible that someone like who has basically like most of the the most direct voice to speak to the American people is like literally saying on national television, like the CIA took down the president, mm -hmm. not just in terms of JFK, but also in terms of Nixon. Yeah. But it's and that like, the JFK cover up was right, connected right, to taking right, Nixon down. Right. I'm and, sorry. I didn't no, and it's like on the one hand, it's like it is remarkable, and that's partially why, if you think in, in the way that you voice things, it's like the Trump movement represents a breakaway from white like for a breakaway from whiteness as it has existed but at the same time it's still partially constrained by some of like almost like the ideological vestiges of like white supremacy as it has been and u.s hegemonism yeah, yeah. this yeah. idea that it is the deep state and the quote liberals right. that took that have turned the country into a socialist authoritarian right. regime right. but and then they, yeah, yeah, but I'm, yeah, I'm saying, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait, I have a question. Go ahead. Sorry, Serafina. It's no, really quick. No, it's no, just no. to Jeremiah's point about the Trump movement being a breakaway from whiteness. Because, okay. and like, it's so weird how, like, the modern media, like, the Proud Boys and all those people mm -hmm. who literally center whiteness in why they support Trump, mm -hmm. like, I don't know. It's like so paradoxical to me because I understand exactly what you mean. I understand what you mean all the time, too, when you bring up. Trump and how he reveals that the deep state is against the people. Mm -hmm. But when they choose to represent him yeah. through those people, yeah. I don't know, it's like so confusing because I can't separate mm -hmm. what I see in the media from like what we're talking about. Like mm -hmm. I understand both, but they just seem like two different yeah. universes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I feel like, well, I don't think the Proud Boys are representative mm -hmm. of the 
vast majority of people who make up the Trump movement. And I think part of the goal of the media is to take the most fringe and extreme elements and to say that this is what the Trump movement is, which is how they're able to make the argument that this is a fascist movement. Or that's the direction that the movement is destined to go. Like it's ahead of the curve, basically, but that it represents it. Remember at the debate when the guy was pressing him about the Proud Boys, pressing Trump, and then Trump said, oh, okay, I guess stand down. And they were like, see, he knows. Yeah. It's a secret, like the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah like, sure. like, literally, Trump was like, I don't, okay, stand down. I don't know who these people are. And they're like, he's secretly messaging to them. Right. Mm. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Literally, I saw everyone say, oh, stand that. down. As yeah. if he's Code. like a general on, exactly. like, yeah. stand down. Like, 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 oh, 59. Don't yeah. do it. <laughs> the whole thing. Like, that a mighty I thought thing. I was going crazy during the debate. No, yeah. I just thought I saw a different debate than everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there's a there's a columnist in the New York Times named mm-hmm. Thomas Edsall E D S A L L, and uh, the two mm-hmm. columnists in the New York Times that I generally pay more attention to, and that's David Brooks and this guy uh, Thomas Edsall. I kind of would recommend them to you. Thomas Edsall uh, is useful because he, his columns are based upon a survey of recent political science and social science research. And it's, the research is usually uh, having to do with Trump. By the way, you can't talk about American politics without talking about Mm -hmm. Trump. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are, what Trump does and so on. will have the largest impact upon future politics. In fact, the elite trying, the the Democratic Party elite trying to take Biden down has everything to do with their perception that Biden can't be Trump. Mm -hmm. Trump is a ghost hovering over American politics. There's never been anything like Mm -hmm. it. Never been anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's going, to, he's going back to the time. He's going to the Oh, I'm kidding. Sorry, sorry. sorry my, I don't Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Go, 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 go. Okay, just, you know, um, to go over this past you know, on Sunday, the upcoming events. Everybody you want to do that up? first? Mm-hmm. Okay. I was going to say, to get out of the way a little bit. But um, we had met on Sunday. Okay. We're talking about the uh, Brokerson. Yes. Honorable Elijah Muhammad. No, I'm not talking about that. That was not what was on my mind. Okay, sorry. The first thing that was on my mind was the um, upcoming symposium on Du Bois's um, birthday that we're going to do on Black Reconstruction in America, February 25th. So, um, we're still entitling it, I don't know if we've gone over this or not, but um, the title that we're, we've decided upon is The Black Proletariat and the Fourth American Revolution, The Making of a New People. And since it is symposia, we are going to have two panel discussions that day and following with a round table. Um, and this is the part where I don't think that we've talked about uh, here in free school, but for the first panel, uh, we've changed or edited the title a little bit and we've now called it W.B. Du Bois and His Enemies, The Current Struggle to Reclaim Black Reconstruction. Um, so it's a panel that's going over like Black Reconstruction as detractors, what we've been discussing today, Mm. anti-communism, especially. And then the second panel that we will have is W.B. Du Bois and V.I. Lenin, Toward a New Revolutionary Worldview. And that's a panel where we'll discuss uh, the new theoretical synthesis that we've been working out. Um, For the round table, uh this is kind of a working title we haven't fully decided it but it's entitled achieving our nation the fierce urgency of now 
Um, and that's when we'll kind of go over what we're getting to now, like the Trump movement, yeah. um, the practical tasks on the struggle, um, and the three revolutions that we've been discussing. Uh, that's what I wanted to say so far, but we have a working flyer maybe. I showed you, you guys, but I'll pass the phone around so that people can see that. But uh, it was helpful to talk or meet with Midwestern Marks because we're kind of mm -hmm. in discussion with them and them mm -hmm. Philly and being a part of this event as well. Um, so is there anything you guys need to say about this? Only that I was one saying, oh, this would be an easy thing. We've done this before. Oh. And then it turns out to be super difficult again. <laughs> you know. I never felt like it. Yeah, she never be... felt it, but I, I said, oh no, don't worry about it. We got this. Yeah. But we it's that's why, you know, we uh we had to uh re uh label the first panel, mm -hmm. and that's because of developments. Uh, Black Reconstruction and its enemies, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and then this, the uh, second one is obvious, the synthesis. But the town hall, which will be less of pa uh, the panel, less of the panel format and less of the open format, open discussion format. And here is where we have to jump into uh, because see, if we say, say a new people are emerging, people say, well, what about the politics? Look, you got Trump, you got fascism, you got white supremacy movements. And we have to, we have to talk about, even including the questions you're asking, Sade, uh, is the Trump movement a fascist and white supremacy movement? Uh, and if not, what is, is it? And how do, what are the practical tasks in front of us, the American people in general, to achieve something new? Now, there are many ways to go at this. We don't have to go through it right now. But this is going to be, and that's why I want to bring platypus. We want to bring uh Midwest Marxists, we want to bring uh, other people, individuals into the dialogue to the extent that they're willing to join it. Um, but that's yeah. Yeah, the only reason why I didn't feel like this was going to be an easy event mm -hmm. was because of like the theoretical and ideological yeah. undertaking that we're doing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I just wanted to also say, just in the put it in the air as like good juju, because <laughs> I think that. Um, uh, and also apropos the discussion that we're having today, um, we're obviously kind of, to me, it feels like maybe it is a jump ahead, but it is something that I'm feeling like we're kind of moving into some deeper waters. Absolutely. Um, I agree with that. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, the ideological and political struggles um, that I think that will kind of like come into um, are going to be intense. Um, Mm -hmm. And I just reiterate, I think I mentioned already this last week, but just, you know, like we don't really have anything to fear, anything to be afraid of. And that, you know, I think that by standing our ground, um, standing by principle, um, and as we do, when we when we talk about King and we uh, celebrate his life, we yeah. show his life and we teach his life and we stand by him. And we're standing by the people, we're standing by history, and that's something that um, is our upper hand and that's our strong hand. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to let other people know that. Mm -hmm. um, but as for the uh, festival in April, mm -hmm. still titled Unconquered Love, uh, Unconquered Love, mm -hmm. The Magnificent Lives of Paul Robeson and the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. um, we were discussing like the different people, like we were already doing. Like you guys also going to the jazz concert was not only only for you guys to enjoy the concert, but to you know, right, right, right. Um, logistically, kind of. And Alfie and and mm -hmm. Bobby said they have reserved the dates. Right, right, and also another important thing about this concert is the political, the politics of it, mm -hmm. and having that be clear. 
um, again, like it's important to know or to state, you know, per performer and per event or like per the event itself, like the mission statement, um, what not only the festival is about, but what the performers are. Yeah, yeah, um, oh yeah, oh yeah. So we're kind of like working that out and mm -hmm. deciding the, uh, oh, yeah. uh, the who's gonna act first and like that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, so we're still thinking about having like decorating, uh, hopefully the church in these banners of the uh, leaders, Paul Robeson, Mohammed, and uh, yeah, 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 Cool. Well, I'm focused more on the Black Reconstruction event just because it's closer. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say that that's yeah. like another thing. But. but yeah, I also was, I remember Doc would repeat week after week, like, oh, we don't have to talk about T Boys' birthday because it'll be easy. And I was like, I have no idea why you think it's easy. I, I think it's because, so well. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I feel like it's ending, it's, it became the most intense to discuss and i feel like you could feel it in free school too because the thing is is i just don't think black reconstruction is a well understood no, discourse. No. i definitely don't think i understood it until like this year yeah. <laughs> and we had read it like i had read it multiple times yeah. and i don't think it gets the respect in the way it should and at the same time, it also, I feel like we've talked about it in free school as we've read it, but I do think it holds the key to understanding, like, not just understanding America today, but even to just place America where it belongs, you know, it's revolutionary history. I, I, like anywhere from 1776 to the Civil War reconstruction period, which is necessary to understand if you want to understand King, the significance of King and the civil rights movement. Which is what Henry Winston said, which is he's like, you can't understand the importance mm -hmm. of King and the Black Freedom Movement unless you actually understand like Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. Reconstruction, that like Reconstruction and what happened in the Civil War was the emergence of the Black proletariat and what it re what it represents as like what the American proletariat could be. And that's why I'm really like I'm really excited for the Black Reconstruction event. I feel like usually I'm kind of overwhelmed by like super ideological stuff because it really forces me to be like sharp. <laughs> and like, I, I think I'm a pretty like ideologically lazy person most of the time, unless I'm forced to like really focus. But I think the event's also exciting because of the panels, like the way we've, we're taught, like we come out guns blazing, okay, not literal guns, but you know, yeah. coming out like strong saying, here's not just like, here's not just why anyone who subscribes to Gerald Horn, the 1619 Project, Eric Foner, it just like all different aspects of what people are trying to say about Du Bois or Black Reconstruction. Here's not just why, if you subscribe to those ideas, you're taking the side of the ruling class and you are also neutralizing the American people to actually like take power in this country. Um, but here's why like you're also counter revolutionary and also, here's why Du Bois, like in Black Reconstruction, what he's saying is he is like clearly saying this is the revolutionary develop, like this is the revolutionary process in America. Here's everything that has been achieved, and here's like, and here is how you um, how you can understand the civil rights movement and understand today. And then also, like I am, like Serafina read out, like I'm super excited for the Lenin and Du Bois panel too I because too. yeah that's where that's where it's midwestern Marx and um that's where midwestern that's the panel midwestern Marx would be a part of mm -hmm. and like i also like the format like we came up with the format right now where for each panel there are three presenters who assert their perspective on the topic but then there are three discussants for each panel too and the whole point is that the discussants don't present something but they uh, they emerge after the presentations and they either agree or disagree with what the perspectives asserted so then it opens up to, into a conversation about like these important yeah everything that basically has implications for the future of this country 
and the future of revolution and what do we mean by revolution and what's the role of the people in that um mm -hmm. yeah and and then on the first panel danny like that's the panel danny will be on which is about um du bois and his enemies reclaiming black reconstruction and so and the, i'm really and then obviously like i'm excited about the round table or the town mm -hmm. hall because that's where um hopefully Erin Haygood, the president of Platypus, yeah. she'll be on that. I haven't called her yet. Okay. She messaged me today. Just... Yeah, tell her tell her to forgive me okay, for no that. Problem. Yeah. That's also where um okay. we originally hoped okay. Spencer Leonard would be on that one. Just say uh, his wife's birthday said that. <laughs> yeah, so just like yeah. So we might so we might maybe like someone else from Platypus could be on there, or we could just like no yeah. one else has to be. But that's also where, so that's where we combine everyone, you know, Aaron from Platypus, someone from Midwestern Marx, free schoolers, and it's a discussion of how do you understand the state of the American people today, yeah. you know, and the future. And so, I mean, anyways, like, I feel like, I say this about many events, but I actually mean it this time, but this is like, you mean it every time. Okay, I mean it every time, or maybe I don't, I don't know. But mm -hmm. this is definitely actually my favorite so far. Oh. The way we're challenging ourselves mm -hmm. to deal with really difficult questions that have every implication of the future of the American mm -hmm. people. It does. And that's why it feels also, I think, personal. Because I think we're not, I think it's very courageous. Like we're not, we're not afraid to talk about like America's revolution and potential. We're not afraid to talk about Trump, the Trump movement leading into the 2024 election. I think it's all coming together and, um, I don't know. I'm just, yeah, I'm also, I think I'm just also excited about the different people we've invited to come. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, Sarah, Tina, like it was just really nice to talk to the Midwestern mm -hmm. Marxists. Um, yeah, because you can, I was already like starting to imagine the kind of conversations yeah, we have. Yeah. Because that's the thing, like everyone who we've invited, like we're all just so, we come from, I think there are different perspectives, but we're all excited to ask the central question, which mm. is, what is the state of the American people? What's the path forward? Like, what is revolutionary? What's counter-revolutionary? What is fascism? What is fascism? How are people defining fascism? What is the purpose of defining certain things as fascist? Like, I think that I'm excited to have that conversation. Mm. And yeah, like Midwestern Marx, they even said it. They're like, sorry, we talk a lot because we're just so excited. And Jeremiah was like, you belong in the preschool. <laughs> yeah, because yes. it's like, yeah, let's talk. Like, I want to talk. And, and then, yeah, go ahead. Just to add on to that, to build on that, because it shows that it's like we're dealing with authentic people. We're dealing about the real yes. world issues. Yes. We're dealing about real world politics. And I think that's also what's important about this event in particular, because mm -hmm. it's exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, how can we, like, how, well, not even how, but we are tapping into the capacity of the people, mm -hmm. and we are actually, um, what's that word? Uh, no, um, I'm just thinking of extracting that, but it's something else. Mm -hmm. But we're actually being able to use it. Mm -hmm. um, in a yeah. way that everybody can understand yeah. mm -hmm. and that is entirely true like people can touch it people can see it and they can know it um and i think that's what's important about um this is that we're dealing with the real world stuff that's, and don't forget the point that you continually make pretty much a big part of what we're going to do is also treating black reconstruction as a philosophy yeah. no but that's the other thing yeah go ahead because like <laughs> because what i'm like so excited about all the time with free school and this is why i'm in it is because i'm concerned about the mm -hmm. development and the process of um what i always go to which is maybe too much but like evolving like actually growing um like really and what i mean by that is that like the revolutionary stuff is not like for the sake of like well things need to be upturned or need to be changed mm -hmm. but things need to become better mm -hmm. um and i think that's why why i go to or why i'm excited about free school why i learn or why it's even important to learn is because it's about actually developing into what we're talking about now the new human being mm -hmm. this new people mm -hmm. coming to being developing um, and it's everything that has to do with how we know, um, mm -hmm. everything with how we use science, art, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And that's why mm -hmm. it makes me excited about this event. Mm -hmm. 
And someone asked, um, what's the date and location of the Du Bois conference? The date is February 25th this year. From 10 to 6, right? to six at the new place of the Church of the Crucifixion. And we'll be posting all of that very, very soon. Todd also asked if um, we could share the title of the event and the panel titles in the chat, which I can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We'll do that. Should I pass on the flyer? I know. And then we should find a way to share it. Nuri and Jeremiah, do you all want to update us on the Korea conference? Let's, 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 let's get in. Uh, <laughs> it's still in development. We're working. Uh, we're working with Anna on writing a draft of the vision statement. Yes. Um, but a lot of it has, it's been really helpful to talk through just like ideas and reporting in free school. Cause I think, yeah, like I think it's the free school is dealing and I feel like trying to hold on to a lot of different ideas and different moving parts and different yes. events. But I think the beautiful thing is that all of, the events are in conversation with each other yeah, and thing. things that we learn and are developing in the black reconstruction event is really relevant for the korea event mm -hmm. um and just our conceptualization of it i, I apologize yeah. if this was said is there a tentative date i'm just trying to get a sense um, i know it's in march was kind of end of plan. march like either end of the march. 18th like the weekend of the 18th or the weekend of the 25th yeah. i just mm -hmm. yeah i just heard from on who is talking with AAI people that they have the weekend of March 17 to 18 available, but they might be booked for March 24 to 25. That's okay. mm. That works for us. Okay. March 17? Yeah. yeah, 17 and 18. All right, right. But that's still, that's still a tentative. Um, okay. But you'll probably hear more from us next week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, I, I mean, like a lot of a lot of how we want to frame this is through the lens of, you know, there's only so much we can really do, I think, to say, you know, to like speak to like Korean people in Korea. Our message is really for the American people. And we want this to be something that is actually fruitful for the development of what we are trying to mm -hmm. put forward, which is, yeah, a fourth American revolution, the remaking of a new people. How does the struggle for peace in Korea, but really the American struggle for peace play into that? Like mm -hmm. how can it advance that revolutionary movement, which are which we are seeing as like in becoming, um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> You know, you know, you talk about burning questions of the time. And uh, I think, you know, because of the way we work and what we know, we, we couldn't do less than what we're doing. Mm -hmm. If it were being done generally, we wouldn't have to do it. Mm -hmm. But we have to do it because yeah. it is not being done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or the opposite. That's why this, um, you know, the... Uh, Black Reconstruction Conference Symposia, we're calling it, is so important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This distort. I'm, I'm so glad you're back, Nuri. <laughs> I talk about you every weekend. Yeah. <laughs> really does about every yes. We are glad you are back. Other people are saying it. Yeah, other people, <laughs> it's, it's a generalized word now in the free school. I mean, people that I never knew used it are now using it. Because I didn't pay attention. Like, I didn't know that he was going to curse so much. <laughs> <laughs> I like, yeah. My aunt was like, oh, 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 If I had known, I would have But no, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry, don't worry. I'm sorry. I didn't say nothing. I didn't say nothing. She's still watching. Okay, all right. But 
you know, black deconstruction, mm -hmm. the misappropriation of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what, and I, I you know, because I kept quoting Miriam, but God, I mean, why? Why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, and it falls into what um, you were saying, Jeremiah, about Roland Barth and Michelle uh, Foucault. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, do you know they're talking about running Michelle Obama for president? What the hell? Wait, what? He's a part of it. Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama. Yeah, yeah. Oh, See, I if they take Biden it. down, Hillary Clinton. You don't have many. Yeah. People. They have no one. Huh? They have, they yeah, have they no have, one. Yeah. All the people that they tried to prop up, like uh, Pete Buttigieg. Yeah, no, Pete is out of there. Yeah, you know, and uh, uh, Newsom, the governor of yeah. California. Oh, no. And so now they got uh, Michelle Obama. It might, it might end up being Biden again. They have nothing but this this thing of black reconstruction is anything we want to say it is and i know um uh nuri is reading i don't know how far you've gotten and uh, it, 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 you know it 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 doesn't become that useful but it's it's very boring but um, i did see that um, that conversation did you see it i did tell me what you I know. Did you you oh, saw no, it? I saw parts of it, but I was just kind of feeling annoyed. Yeah, yeah. What, what did I don't you know, think? How was he able? Who was See that? It was Eric Boner and Henry Louis Gates. Henry Louis Gates. Like, oh, but um, <laughs> I um thought it was kind of like they were just whitewashing in a way. That's like no, you know they just like mm. you can kind of take any essence of what Du Bois mm -hmm. is doing and say. Like, yes, I believe in Du Bois. Right, like, right, right. Um, but it's like, I don't even think you understand Du Bois. Speak up a little I mean, bit more. I don't think they really understand Du Bois, though. Because I, I feel would, like the thing about Stoner is that they oh, it's like it's similar to the thing that they do with king which mm -hmm. is that they recognize yes. that he yes. their figures that are yes. important and you can't directly like basically like shit on them but then so then you just take like catchphrases or like ideas Some but then you on. misappropriate oh, so, them ooh, ooh, yeah. just but don't don't right. forget henry lewis gates and he was talking as though he's writing a script for a PBS documentary. All the time. <laughs> All the time. But he did mention the first chapter, The Black Worker. He mentioned, and not in a frivolous way, he didn't go into it. the fourth chapter, The General Strike, uh, as now all of that is uh, excluded in Foner's Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, which then makes it a takedown or dismissal of Black Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. But the thing, let me just say, and then I'm going to turn it over to oh, Surfing. Did, did I just, I'm afraid I'm going to forget. But okay, go, go ahead, since, I, since you have early stages. I do okay. not. Okay, well, go ahead. <laughs> Okay. But also, no, but also, I just remember the one question that I do think that Henry Louis Gates got wrong mm -hmm. completely mm -hmm. is if the slaves freed themselves or if the North freed the slaves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like a mis like constru construing sometimes because mm -hmm. we look down on people. Mm -hmm. um, or like, how did you train it? It was like, okay, this is mm -hmm. the um. It was like, uh, I think it was talking about how Abraham Lincoln had signed. The emancipation um, population yeah. is like, oh, and then that last, the ending at like thing in that chapter where like Lewis Gates was mentioning the poetry of Du Bois and how like poetic it was mm. that black people were like free, free, mm -hmm. free. Mm -hmm. no, 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 but the thing about it is that, like, okay, the black people, the slaves, the proletariat, the essence of that mm -hmm. weren't waiting for the mm -hmm. state in that mm -hmm. in that particular time period, or the even the officials like mm -hmm. Lincoln or anybody to sign anything mm -hmm. um, to uh, free mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. But they had already been freed, mm -hmm. and then Abraham Lincoln had to sign it because. Mm -hmm. like they were freeing themselves right. already and yeah. and you know um but this is 
you know, makes it difficult because it appears on the one side, oh, everybody's recognizing Black Reconstruction after 85 years, mm -hmm. you know, of suppressing it. Oh, look, the enlightened Eric Foner, who on the 50th anniversary of the, of the publication of Black Reconstruction, publishes a work that dismisses Black Reconstruction. You know, you can just look through the index. Du Bois is mentioned once, and you look General Strike, you look a number of things that are uh, foundational to, there's no discussion of it. It's, and so Foner is, and that's when they meant liberal democracy, the fight was yeah. for liberal democracy, yada, yada, yada. This is where it gets complicated. Is it just a discussion over the fine points of Black Reconstruction and Du Bois' writing of it, a la uh, Horn, uh, it wasn't a general strike, it was a wildcat strike. Well, if you go, but anyway, you, you see what I'm saying? So I think we have to go into this with the assumption that it's complete bad faith on the part of these intellectuals that are closely connected to the ruling class. How do you know they're closely connected? Why are you saying closely connected to the ruling class? The ruling class through the agencies of the deep state took over the elite universities in this country 50 years ago. No more protests, no. These will be factories producing the political line that supports the ruling class. So how do you come from Harvard and Columbia with clean hands? You just, you have to assume the opposite, which I do. So we're in an ideological, that's why the thing because of, oh shit, we're in a tough ideological struggle. And I agree with you, Seraphina. These are not just, he's not just talking about events but he's presented new categories of knowledge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are the consequences of this? Mm -hmm. It's not just Eric Foner's facts and Du Bois's facts. Yeah. No, it is what are the categories that you're using mm -hmm. to understand this uh, revolution and that I think that's where it's going to be. That's where we're going to land in this. Now, the difficulty is, I hope everybody that participates will have had a chance to read Black Reconstruction. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, because it's, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yes, maybe we should, maybe we should um, have the No, maybe we should uh, tell, talk about who's on. Yes. Panel so yeah. that those people can what? So those people can start reading <laughs> <laughs> or, or or follow the free oh, school's that? reading of it in our discussion. Oh, you're talking about yeah. it. Okay. I thought you meant people. No, no, no. No, we yeah. and, and even even like you say, I yeah, agree with you, Emily. It's not a one read thing. No, yeah. no it's, it's really, really not. not. It's really no. not. <laughs> so we're, we're getting. I think about it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So for the first panel, W. E. B. Du Bois and his enemies, the current struggle to reclaim Black Reconstruction. The like I said, there's three presenters and then three discussants. Mm -hmm. um, so the presenters are the ones who are going to like present right. something. Um, so the three presenters are Mary, Jahan, and Danny. And then the three discussants are Stan. Anna, um, who I haven't talked to yet, and then Pastor Keith, who I haven't yeah. talked to. Yeah. Um, so those people who haven't confirmed yet will are like tentative. But for the second panel, um, okay. W. E. B. Du Bois and B. I. Lennon toward a new revolutionary worldview. Um, the presenters are Serafina, Jeremiah, and someone from Midwestern Marx, with the three discussants being Sade, Caleb, and Alice. And then on the round table, Achieving Our Nation, The Fierce Urgency of Now, um, 
the participants are Aaron from Platypus, um, possibly someone, a second person from Platypus, someone from Midwestern Marks, Megna, Emil, and Doc. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Uh, you got yeah. a little bit of Why did you say this was going to be Yes. I don't know. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, maybe about two weeks ago, I was feeling a little like, oh, you know what? This is a very daunting undertaking. But then when I really think about how this has been developed over all these and how it builds off of what we were laying out in the 10th anniversary, mm -hmm. it's actually made me really excited to see. Um, all the strides that preschool has even made in the last month. Yeah, last four months. <laughs> the last four months, the maybe last, last six months. Like, yeah. But especially like how we're building so much and making so much ground in the last month that it really does go back to, I mean, yeah, when Seraphine and talking about the idea of evolution or even just like the progress we're making, you can really see it like week to week almost mm -hmm. in terms of what we're taking on and how we're not back backing down. And I feel like... Um, yeah, with that framing, it makes me, you know, it hasn't melted away, you know, a lot of different, you know, feelings of feeling daunted by how great the tasks are taking on, but it is making me really excited for this yeah. conference. So I just wanted to reiterate my excitement and just even observing how much um, work that has been done and how even the conversations we're having every week are really moving tangibly um, step, steps forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess something that that's always weighing me down is the sense that we not only set a high bar, but we always want to achieve or overachieve. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and I feel we we almost sometimes I do. I mean, at least I feel I feel that we almost have to get it right and perfectly right to say that there are no uh, spaces. For the as in the first panel, the enemies of Du Bois mm -hmm. to talk shit. Yeah. You know, and uh, and there is you know just social media. It's a lot of shit talking and bullshit. You know about um, and and you know you know what I'm saying. And so there is no space for. Or what do you mean, the enemies of the boys? Well, we're going to say what we mean. Yes. Yeah. All of that. So it's, mm -hmm. and the fact, you see, the first thing that we go at it that way, because we, we had, remember, we had to discuss this, mm -hmm. you know, this first panel. And it was because of the thing with um, Foner and Horn and others. Um, yeah, that's all. Yeah. And like they say, these are almost fighting words ideologically. Go ahead, Jim. Oh well, um, just to confirm. So the conference title is "The Black Proletariat and the Fourth American Revolution: The Making of a New American People." Right. And and yeah. under that, a symposium, a symposium on, on the Black Reconstruction. Okay. Um, one of, I think one of the possible lines of criticism, I think, especially on the panel on like Du Bois, but also Horn and Eric Foner is recently, I don't know if this will actually come up, but I think it's just something interesting to think through is recently Ron DeSantis in Florida passed like a ban on proposed like AP African American history. Yeah. And I think there are people who are saying um, that he's like, or I saw on Twitter, like, it's like, the white the quote unquote white leftists who are attacking Gerald Horn are basically agreeing with people like Ron DeSantis who are attacking black history. And like I do think that this it's, is this is when it gets yeah. really difficult yeah. because they're like moving targets. Right. Right. But I'm sorry, I didn't mean no, 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 yeah, but I think it is yeah. like worth thinking through like why people or like like a response because it also goes into the Trump movement thing and the cheating yeah. our nation. Mm -hmm. Like I think a lot of it will come out in the round yeah. table. Yeah. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. And sorry, I'm really tired. Yeah. And, oh, and you yeah. just got oh, you mean from jet yeah. lag or just yeah. oh, but then also right. this is a lot. Yeah, it's just so, I'm telling you. It oh, is a lot. No, it's like four a.m. <laughs> she seems great, actually. It's oh, a lot, yeah. Keep going. Soon it'll be 6 a.m. Yeah. 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 Keep pushing her. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sleep. 
No, but I think it'll be like I do think it'll be really interesting because yeah, like I get why on the one hand it's a really big deal, like it was never going to be easy, but then also I think we are pretty well prepared because mm-hmm. it's all we've been talking about and thinking about mm-hmm. like even through the 10th anniversary. And so yeah, I'm really welcoming the opportunity to be able to like really talk through it. Um and yeah because even thinking about the sequence of events with the black reconstruction event which is talking about literally america like american history america's place like um and like its relationship to revolutionary science like generally but then also specifically for america and then i feel like with the korea event it's that one will be also much more about the current world situation mm-hmm. and how that impacts mm-hmm. like what happens in America, like the opportunities, but also like the urgency of it. And I think it'll also give us a way to, yeah, like think through more of like Du Bois and Lenin, like revolutionary science, like mm-hmm. what's specific to America, what is so, like, what are things that we can learn from like other countries and other like, I guess, ways that um, humanity has moved. And then all of that, I feel like it it will nicely culminate or like wrap up with like the Elijah Muhammad Paul Robeson Festival, because then you can see like the intercivilizational elements like playing out in America and like Paul Robeson and Elijah Muhammad, like two great Americans who I think were a part of like mm. a great world period. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's also interesting yeah, to think about how all three of those events yeah. actually work in a sequence, yeah. because I feel like you can't, yeah, you can't like pigeonhole preschool into just want like into like just an American thing or like just like an eclectic world house Mm -hmm. like both like all those sides are needed Mm -hmm. um for where we are so Mm -hmm. yeah I just think it's cool (laughs) (laughs) should we do we have any more comments um someone uh Christopher Romero said earlier that I've always interpreted the blame, the quote unquote blame the communist rhetoric as a lack of willingness from MAGA Americans to accept that this that this is an American problem rather than a foreign invasion yeah. from yeah. communists. That's, That's true. true. Yeah. 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 I agree with yeah. that. Um, oh, yeah. And then Daryl Wasteland Mitchell says, running, Ob- Mo- running Michelle Obama is really not friendly, but desperate. There are other options too coming out of Michigan, like Gretchen Whitmer, the governor oh, of, Mich- wow. of Michigan. Um, Josh Shapiro. Some, someone named BK <laughs> says Biden will have to run his campaign from a hospital bed. Oh, uh, no. Daryl Wayside Mitchell says, okay, it is funny, but actually not funny. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> How can you do the laugh? Dangerously muted, yeah. Laughing is good. Okay. Laughing is good. Well, people, it's after two. So don't forget, you guys have an 8 p.m. concert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> so, shut up. So, um, yeah, like I told you. <laughs> okay, folks, it's been a oh, wonderful no. morning <laughs> and afternoon. And I guess uh, we'll, we'll end the live stream now. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Can we talk shit now? No, 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 no